Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Time for Ask the Tech Guys. I'm Leo Laporte. Coming up, can you get a private AI? Hmm, and I am Micah Sargent, and we answer a question about managing multiple subscriptions for your business with your Apple ID. And then, Spaceman Rod Pyle and his memories of Voyager 1. It's all coming up next on Ask the Tech Guys. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Ask the Tech Guys with Micah Sargent and Leo Laporte. Episode 2021, recorded Sunday, April 21st, 2024. Warp, warp. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? That's Howdy. there. That there's Micah Sargent. And that there's Leo Laporte. And Stripey Socks. Oh, I've got hearts on mine. My mama made these. I, I thought I'd wear them. You know, I was back uh, east. That's why I look such a cowboy. I was back east. <laughs> the eastern cowboys. <laughs> Easter. I was back east. Uh, I, I remember Panning talking. for gold. I remember talking to a, a cowboy in California. He said, those aren't eastern. Those aren't westerns. They're easterns. It all happened east of us. Yeah, that's Easterns. True. Anyway, I was in the east in Rhode Island. Rhode Had a nice Island. dinner with Andy Anako, by the way. Oh, good. I'm glad you got to you. see Andy. Uh, and I was visiting with my mom, who's in the old age home. And she's just doing great. Good, good. And she made these socks, and so uh, I'm wearing them in honor of my mama. Ah, uh, well, they are very. It was a nice. nice visit. It was a very nice visit. Good. Yeah. And I brought back a leather cowboy hat. No, I didn't. <laughs> I have this. This is local. This is a. This is a western. Local made. Well, do you see this problem the parents are having now? Oh, the parents, they're going, we, we need to... Wall Street Journal. Be in touch with the kids. Schools want to ban phones. It's a problem in schools. Kids TikToking, <laughs> YouTubing in class. So they try to ban them in schools, and the parents say, no, we want to know where our kids are at all times. Does this not make you go, you know, I didn't. my parents didn't know where I was at all times. But now, but see, once you get that. Once you have it, once it's you hard have to it, let it go. Like in Brush, Colorado, says the Wall Street Journal, teachers and administrators settled on a compromise for the 2022-23 school year. Students could keep their phones, but they have to be out of sight. Okay. Which is fair. To reach their parents, they need teacher's permission, and they have to go to the office to use the phone. If a student's busted phone confiscated, parents need to pick it up. But parents didn't even like that. Several parents transferred their kids out of the school saying, no, I want my kids. I don't know what Did they, they Are wanted. they texting them during the day? I guess wow. so. That's odd to me. I guess so. But I understand also how parents feel where they want to keep. Well, and to be fair, you know, you've got lots of school shootings. You've got all, you know, what, yeah. all the stuff that goes on. I understand wanting to be able to be in touch if you sure. need to be, but. I don't know that, <laughs> that parents are worried necessary. about their kids in right. school. That part yeah. part of that's a little bit of a problem because I don't think kids are free range anymore. Right? Because parent we we parents are so worried about our kids. Oh hi, good to see you. This is the show where you answer tech questions. Oh. I probably should have mentioned that at eight eight eight. Get those phone <laughs> calls are coming in. We just got right into seven two four. I made a song for us. Did you hear that song? Yeah, we listened to like four of them last eight, week. Four. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. It all blends together. It all know. blends. It all blends together. It's all in the past. You got to say but goodbye. But that number was in the song, which is good. ATG at twit.tv or Zoom us. You can Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Call.twit.tv. Uh, and we will take your questions in a moment, but we like to start off slow. <laughs> <laughs> slow burn. Really get you into the show. Ease you into the show. Yeah. Uh, by talking about some of the week's news. So that's my story. What you got? Do you have anything? I got uh, other no, stuff. No, no, no. There's, there's another story that we should talk about. Uh, it's big. And you actually, I know, did uh, lock it into your links, which is that there's uh, potentially some precedent being set when it comes to what is considered testimony versus what is not. Oh, yeah, this is big. biometrics. Yeah, we've kind of thought this would be the case. So the issue is, can a police officer say, give me your thumb, buddy, and push it on your phone and unlock your phone? Or... Hold it up to you, unlock it, and then look at your phone. Can they do that? Can they do it? Because, of course, we have a right to not incriminate ourselves. Uh, and so that is where the the disagreement happens. Is putting my fingerprint down or looking at the phone uh, potentially incriminating myself? 
And I, it was interesting that it was based on cognition. I thought that was that was a, a fascinating sort of uh, crux of the argument. It, does it count as cognitive? Um, is is it is it cognitive to actually take your fingerprint and put it on the phone to sort of unlock what's in your brain, which is where the uh, right to not incriminate yourself right. is protected? This is kind of what uh, courts have ruled in the past as well. Uh, f- there's kind of standing precedent. The police can't come into your home and say, unlock that safe, brother. You can't get you to, to, to do what's in your mind. They don't, have ac- they don't have legal access to the contents of your mind. They can't force you to do that. But they could take a hair for DNA, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they could take a thumbprint, right? So the judge, and I think probably correctly ruled, but it's good for us to know this. That's the thing. Know the, the implication there because that could mean that you would have to hand over that. Now, this is the time where I tell you with an iPhone, if you press and hold all three buttons, the uh, volume up, volume down, and the side button all at once, it turns your phone into, uh, well, it, it locks your phone in such a way that face ID or touch ID doesn't work and you actually have to type in your passcode. And apparently, as it stands, passcode does require cognition and therefore is more protected as things stand uh, in a way that you would not be required to incriminate yourself. It's interesting. This is a Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals judgment. And in their ruling, they said, to date, neither the Supreme Court nor any of our sister circuits have addressed whether the compelled use of a biometric to unlock an electronic device is testimonial. That's the debate over whether you're testifying against yourself or if it's just passively giving a fingerprint or a hair the, the panel said, yeah, it's not testimonial. It's just like taking a fingerprint. Um, you can be forced to use your thumb. So this is really important. Have a good password on your mm-hmm. phone. You could actually turn off face ID or thumbprint. But I think it's so convenient. People don't want to turn that off. But know that gesture that Mike had just mentioned to force your phone to go into the mode where you have to give it a password. And then... <laughs> In theory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they can't say, son, what's your password? And you you could say, well, uh, the United States Constitution, Fifth Amendment says I don't have to give that to you, sir. And now, depending on <laughs> how adamant they are, because what they, you know, you, you could be at the border and they could say, well, okay, well, you, you just rest cool your heels there in uh, airport jail for a while. Yeah. We'll see what Who you Who will break first? Say. Right. Game uh, of chicken. I think it's probably if you're crossing the border, good idea not to have anything incriminating on your any of your electronics. I think that's a good bit of advice. Maybe don't have anything incriminating on any of your electronics ever. At all. Ever. What a thought. Huh. What a thought. I'll have to keep that in there's mind. A, there's an idea. Uh, so, yeah, we, we've we actually talked about this over the years uh, because there hasn't been a definitive judgment. But I think the general consensus is anything you have in your mind, like a password, is protected. Mm-hmm. That's your private property. And uh, they can't compel you to reveal that. So that's good news. Uh, the other thing kind of related uh, is that the FISA spy program has been reauthorized and Senator and President Biden has assigned that into law. That was the renewal of Section 702. Now, there are, were quite a few amendments to this that added some features. In fact, uh, there was some concern that it extends the FISA to cover more than it used to. Mm. Senator uh, Ron Wyden uh, and Josh Hawley introduced an amendment that would have taken language out. That ex- and this is the this is a little tricky, but I'll, ex- I'll explain it. There's language in the bill that expands the definition of an electronic communications service provider, which would normally be Twitter, Facebook your Verizon, to anyone who has access to equipment that is being used or may be used to transmit or store wire electronic communications. In other words... Anybody with a device that can communicate. Yeah, or your apartment landlord. Yeah. Because they can get into the basement. There's that device. There's all sorts of... It extends it quite... uh, Wait, yeah, can you read that again? Anyone? Anyone who has access, access to equipment being used to transmit or store 
electronic communications. I have access to a router, so I you should have also be included in yeah, that, right? You, you are. are included in that. You are. That's basically everybody. So they introduced this amendment to say, uh, Ron Wyden, who's very smart, uh, introduced this, but it failed. Oh, good. No. No? They were trying to block that. That's in the bill. That's in oh, the law Oh, it failed. Now. The block was failed. It failed to block it. Dang it. Um, the Senator uh, uh, Ron, Rand Paul and Dick Durbin introduced amendments imposing warrant requirements on surveilling Americans. Failed. <laughs> failed. Okay. Uh, so it's passed, and it gives the, the law enforcement this vast power to surveil us. Which they've had. They've had ever since 9-11. This, this is just more this is the Patriot Act. enshrining it, right? Yeah. Well, it's just renewing. It has to be renewed uh, on a regular basis. It has been renewed. Another thing in there, they stuck in there uh, in, the, uh, in the appropriations for uh, Ukraine and uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. They stuck in a little thing about killing the old TikTok, snuck that in. And now, see, so remember, the Senate was blocking it. It already passed the House once. Uh, the Senate was blocking it, but now it's thought because it's part of this funding bill, it's probably going to go through the Senate. It it looks pretty bad for TikTok right now, which frosts my leather chaps. <laughs> Amen. Uh, because uh, I am, I'm still not convinced that there's and I and I've I've read a lot on this at this point, and I'm still not convinced convinced that there's any ground to the need to divest. It's just, I know some very compelling people have made very good arguments for why it needs to be the case, but I don't know. I don't know. Where do you stand on it right now? Uh, well, here's, here's my problem. So I can, I'll acknowledge and, and Brianna will argue it argued quite, uh, I think, uh, persuasively on Twitter a few weeks ago that there is a threat to our national security that the Chinese government effectively controls TikTok. It's not owned by the Chinese government. They have a, stake in it but also because it operates out of china the chinese government can go in any time and get whatever information tiktok has so there's two concerns one that tiktok could be used to spy on americans and the second that it could be used to propagandize our youth making them think that communism is okay or something like that so the first one i'll dismiss out of hand because every program you have on your phone is doing the same thing and they're collecting that data and they're giving it to data brokers who then sell that data to china China doesn't need TikTok to spy on us. Right. China has many avenues. And unless you're willing to be much more sweeping in your privacy protections, China's going to go, fine, take it. We don't care. Now, there is a legitimate concern, perhaps, that TikTok might be used to propaganda, propagandize us. Although we know, for instance, uh, Chinese and Russian operatives have full reign on Twitter yes. and are constantly posting propaganda there. There's also a Chinese uh, TV broadcast on your cable. CCTV, Chinese Communist Party television, just like there's a Russian television, RT, RT right? on your cable. So they're allowed to broadcast in the United States their propaganda. I think the concern is that TikTok is so compelling, the youth love it so much, that perhaps it more might be more powerful. Maybe it is. But the argument on the other side is that uh, so many people have used TikTok to launch a creative careers, to reach out to... I mean, it's an incredible... Mm -hmm medium for young people in this country and actually all over the world uh and you're taking that away from them and by the way the beneficiary of all this is meta right which whose instagram will immediately take all of that my son who's a big tiktok chef star has two and a half million followers on tiktok is on instagram he has one and a half million but he's he, he was smart he knew they saw this coming so he made sure that he had a second channel and google will scoop up the leftovers with YouTube. the shorts youtube, YouTube shorts. shorts they're trying everybody linkedin has tiktok <laughs> feeds yeah, yeah everybody's knows that tiktok well we can you know so and those and op I, I, I think honestly those media can also be used to propagandize american youth Certainly being used to propagandize American youth into buying more sneakers or whatever it is. <laughs> right. So um, I feel like this is a little bit picking on TikTok because it's Chinese. Because it's the outsider. It's yeah. anti-Chinese. It's the outsider. Without really addressing a very real issue of privacy and propaganda. Those things are going to continue with or, with or without TikTok. So I'm a little disappointed because I think it does take away a voice for a lot of uh, people, especially young Americans, who have used TikTok, my son included, to make their fame and fortune. And, you know, he makes a living thanks to the success that TikTok gave him. 
Uh, but it's not just my son. It's millions of others, right? Uh, some really amazing people uh, have come out of TikTok. Uh, dancers, singers, creatives, little Nas X, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my ride on Old Town Road. <laughs> gonna make he, that whole story was started on TikTok, I think, where he went out, he bought a $50 uh, rhythm track, yeah. and he recorded Old Town Road, and he became a superstar. Thanks to TikTok. Uh, so if I were Taylor Swift, I'd be hopping mad. That's all I can say. Anyway, there you go. That's the news across the nation. Beautiful. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Ask the Tech Guy. Oh. <laughs> Who's coming up on the show today, Mr. Anthony Nielsen? I think it was Sam. No, well, no. Uh, Chris was going to. Had Chris has taken the day off. Yeah. He's going to be back. His fiber went down. The oh, backhoe cut you really it. need Metamucil, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> too much fiber, not good for your internet but access. But we do have Rod Pyle at the top of the hour. Mr. Rod Spaceman, Pyle. Rod Pyle coming up in half Space an hour. Spaceman. And we should mention that that means you get another week. To yes. Take your brilliant picture. Yes, Of yes, what, yes. power? I think it is. I will tell will you. you tell us? Because I wasn't here that Just week. a moment. So I don't know. Chris I was in Mexico. Marquardt said. Yeah. It is... <laughs> TG, oh yeah, yeah, it's powerful, powerful. Powerful. And so you can powerful. use TG Powerful and TG Powerful AI if you do the AI version of the assignment. Of course, this those is go. Be, this Wait, picture I? that I'm doing right now is TG Powerful AF. <laughs> there you go. I did it. Powerful <laughs> AF. Is that one of the ones I can submit as well? No. So uh, take the picture. Uh, tag it TG Powerful, or if you're using AI to make it or modify it, TG Powerful AI. Upload it to Flickr. Get into that Tech Guy group before uh, the end of the week, and then Chris is going to pick some shots, and I'm going to submit this powerful AF shot to uh, to th to the group. Now, Anthony Nielsen, yes sir, filling in for John Ashley. Would you? We could take a break, somebody? or do you want to? Well, we'll just take a little break. That's no, okay. Just a little break. Take a little tiny break. We're at. You know, this is the nineteenth anniversary of Twit this week. I know. Isn't Wednesday that's was the nineteenth birthday of this week in tech? That is a very whole proud of that. human being. So we have a lot. That's a whole human, a full grown human. So we have a bunch of people. I think more than more. I think last count, more than two dozen people coming to the studio later today to watch a, a all live Twit. You're going to be on it. I am. Jason Howell Jason makes his triumph return. He can promote his new Tech Exploder uh, channel on YouTube. And Abrar Alhidi will all be in studio, plus 20 carefully washed members <laughs> of our audience uh, to celebrate, of our club, to celebrate our uh, 19th anniversary as a podcast network. April 17th, 2005 was the first twit so that's i'm looking forward to it. me too our show today brought to you by the wonderful folks at wix studio i got they gave me one minute i can't believe this one minute <laughs> to tell you about wix studio the web platform for agencies and enterprises so here are a few things you can do from start to finish in a minute or less on studio Adapt your designs for every device with responsive AI. Expand Wix Studio's pre-made solutions with back-end and front-end APIs. Generate code and troubleshoot bugs with a built-in AI code assistant. Switch up the styling of hundreds of web pages. That means fonts, layouts, colors, all in a click. Add no-code animations and gradient backgrounds right there in the editor. Start a design library. Package your code and UI in reusable Full stack apps. Oh, and one more big one. <whistles> Deliver everything your client needs in one smooth handover. Huh, my time is up, but you the list keeps on going. You, you got to check it out. I tell you what, every time I go there, I am blown away by how beautiful these sites look. Each one a perfect snowflake, unique, one of a kind. Step into Wix Studio. See for yourself. Go to Wix.com slash studio wix.com slash studio. We'll put a link in the show notes so you can click that link and find out more or on our sponsors page, twit.tv slash sponsors. Thank you, Wix Studio, for supporting Ask Them Thar Tech Guys. <laughs> should I? Should we change the name to Them Thar like Tech Them Guys? I like Them Thar Tech Guys. I like this hat. It gives me a personality I lack otherwise. Maybe not a good personality, <laughs> but, but, it gives, but it does. It's something. 
I feel like I'm in Yosemite. Yeah. 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 Uh, mm-hmm. All right. It is your turn now, Mr. Anthony Nielsen, to pick some wonderful Let's go person. with a, a caller from Texas. Oh, oh that's perfect. Howdy. Caller from Texas, what's your first name? It's John. Hi, John. And what whereabouts in Texas? Because that's a big state. Uh, Central. I don't know where that is. Where's that? It's Central Texas. Central. Like the middle of the state. Oh, oh. Central. I thought you meant the yeah. town of Central. Or Centralia. <laughs> what can yeah, we do I mean, for it you? It could be a town, but I don't know. It could be. It could be. Well, I'm just curious. I am a advocate for VPNs, and given the discussion you had with uh, surveillance, mass surveillance uh, by various organizations, including outside the U.S., I don't want to name any actors or any of that, but um, how do you know a VPN or similar service or protocol is actually at, at work? Like protecting your privacy. That's a really good question. Uh, what this question. Can I... So, uh, as as an anecdote, I'm on the plane flying uh, home from uh, visiting my mom, and they have internet on the plane, and I can't for the life of me get on it. I can't get on it. It just won't work. And I asked the flight attendant. She says, "Well, just keep trying. It'll probably work." Uh, she's it's working for everybody else. She says. Then my the seatmate says, "Oh, you have a VPN turned on?" I said, "Yeah." To protect myself, he says it won't work with a VPN turned on. What? <laughs> well, okay, so there, that's a, that's a good example of how you know it's working <laughs> if it won't let you on, uh, and the people who are running the service obviously monetize the free Wi-Fi by spying on you, right? By collecting information because if it won't work with a VPN, there's a good reason for that. So, but how do you know that your VPN is working? You don't. How do you know that if you're using, I, I, I was using actually open uh, or next DNS, which I use on everything, which is kind of, it's not exactly a VPN. It's a, it's, it just becomes your DNS provider and can block stuff like advertisements and so forth. Uh, but it can also block malware uh, that they didn't like that either. So uh, you, but mostly it's trust. And this is the problem in the modern world. We're all inter, interdependent. And there's a certain amount of trust that required it's basically required in a civilized society. When I drive down the road, I'm trusting that the person coming in the other direction isn't going to suddenly decide that he wants to use my lane instead of his. And there's a certain amount of we're, we're both traveling with two ton vehicles at 60 miles an hour. Mm hmm. There's a lot of trust that goes in just to driving down the road. There's a lot of trust that goes into almost everything we do because we're so interconnected, right? I have to trust the manufacturer of my C-cell sweater did not, in fact, use cow patties to make it or whatever, <laughs> right? There's just trust. So there's a certain amount of trust that goes into the security software you use. Now, because unless you are ready to run uh, Nmap and a packet sniffer, and really check and see. And even then, you can't really, you can validate that it's kind of doing what it's doing. For instance, sending all your traffic to their server. But once it gets to their server, it's off your device. We don't know what the VPN server is doing. It could be making a careful note and sending it to the NSA. There's even, you know, for years been conspiracies that Microsoft has a backdoor for the NSA. I don't know if they do or don't. Uh, there's really no way to, to know. There's really no way to know. Uh, I it's one of the reasons I always recommend if you're going to use crypto software for for encryption that kind of thing that you use open source software. And there's a there is one little trick that I think is really important that real hardcore privacy advocates and paranoias paranoiacs use. It's something called reproducible builds. If you've got a program that's open source, let's say. Uh, your messenger program or your VPN software or your uh, encryption software. It's open source. Normally, people will just download the compiled blob, right, and say, well, I'm, you know, it's open source. I'm sure it, it's the same. But that's not really the trick. If you really want to make sure, there's a lot of effort on your part, that it's secure, you look at the source code, you make sure there's no backdoors, there's nothing you don't understand, everything makes sense, 
And then instead of run, downloading the pre-compiled blob, you compile it yourself locally. It's a reproducible build that will, in theory, give you the same result as the binary blob. Now, here's an interesting point. There's a company called Signal that we all trust, Signal Messenger. You know, uh, Steve Gibson, our security guy, says, oh, yeah, that's the gold standard. Moxie Marlin Spike, I love him and trust him. But for some reason, even though they are open source and they offer open source, they don't make it reproducible builds. You cannot build Signal and run it as a build. You have to use their blob. Mm -hmm. for, for hardcore people, and John, I suspect you might be one of those, that's a non-starter because well, I don't know what's in that blob. That may have an extra little bit of code that's not in the open source source code. So if you really say, look, no, I am not going to use anything that I can't look at. You're going to use an open source version of Linux that has no blobs, no pre-compiled pre proprietary stuff. You're going to compile it all yourself with something like Gentoo or uh, or one of the... Or Arc. Or, yeah, exactly. Uh, you might want to use uh, Tails, which is Desire Cubes. These are all designed to be highly secure. Compile it yourself from scratch. Don't use anybody's binaries. But then you also have the expertise. You need to have the expertise to look at the source code and really know what's going on. You don't have to understand it word for word, but you have to be able to find anything that doesn't make sense or is sending code out somewhere that you don't know about. That would be the only way to do it. And honestly, for 99.999% of everybody... It's just not going to happen. We're going to have to trust. And then you, so then you just have to vet the company. You have to see what other people say about the company. I trust Signal. I don't think Signal's got any shenanigans going on. But honestly, the lack of reproducible builds is a red flag. That's not good. So you want reproduce, you I want open like source with reproducible builds. That's the only way to be sure. Yeah, I feel like that's the main obstacle to getting that digital equivalent of Harry Potter's cloak and visibility. Right. If you know what I mean. Yep. Are you the caller who asked about uh, purchasing multiple laptops? Um, maybe, but yeah, I, I just I, I remembered just had that a lot of security questions. Yeah, no, it was it was a it was a fun question that we got to answer. I remember not too long yeah, ago. Yeah, that was wild, right? Um, oh, wait a minute, I take it back. I lied. Signal does now have reproducible builds uh, for Android, at least. So uh, that's very, very good news. S they've been doing repro for Signal for Android. Now, I don't know why other Signals don't, versions of Signal, but if you, but you know, you're going to be using Android anyway. In fact, you're not going to be using Google Android. You're going to be using, you know, an Android you compiled yourself <laughs> yeah. on a Fairphone or something like that. Graphene. Yeah, Graphene. Graphene's like graphene. good. I like Graphene. But again, you're still using it pre-compiled, I bet you. I don't think you're, are you building it yourself? Well, I gotta learn how to like compile it myself. Right. You know what? If Which, worst case, I mean, it's a lot of work. Worst case, you're gonna learn a lot about how technology, how computers <laughs> work, about coding, and all that stuff. Uh, and you're gonna help protect, protect your privacy a little bit. The thing about open source is most of us just assume that somebody is looking at the code because <laughs> we don't have the skills to look at. It. I mean, I could look at it. I don't have the time. Yeah. I could probably verify everything if i really wanted to i'd spend the rest of my life looking at source Verifying, code and yeah. compiling it but see this is this is where i bring up um douglas adams because in that book uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy i i distinctly remember uh conversations surrounding the other people's problem paradox which is that <laughs> We we say, oh, that's somebody else's. Somebody else will worry about that. And then that person also says, oh, somebody else will worry about that. And then someone else says, oh, somebody else will worry about that. And then finally, you have the person who is a Linux volunteer who discovers a millisecond millisecond lag in SSH and discovers a backdoor. Thank goodness. But that's because we all spend our time thinking it's somebody else's problem to worry about and not verifying. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, if I, I guess what I'm saying in the end is uh, if you, uh, John, from somewhere in Texas, was it John, uh, want to really know whether it's working yeah you got to do the, the you got to take the time to do in. a lot of labor a lot of labor john thank i thank you i thank you for the call i'm wearing the, the the texas hat 
just in your honor <laughs> there. And I, I re I, really respect you. <laughs> I think it was sarcasm. <laughs> I really respect your desire to, to, to verify, you know, trust. What's that, What's that saying? Trust, but verify. Trust. That was Ronald verify. Reagan saying about the uh, so, nuclear arms in the Soviet Union. Trust, but verify. I, I thought it was trust no one. Yeah, that's Steve Gibson. <laughs> yeah, that's Steve Gibson. If you and he calls it TNO, and if you really want to do TNO, you're, you're going to have to somehow make another 24 hours appear in your right. life magic. I mean, by the way, Steve does not open source uh, his his program. Yeah, so you, so uh, you point. have to trust him if you're going to use Spinrite, right? Uh, I maybe someday when he retires, he'll open source it. But that's the thing. Uh, if you really, really, really don't trust anybody, you got to open. You got to Compile your own open source software from from scratch, and you got to review all the code that you're compiling. Uh, a lot of work, but it is doable. It's possible. I just think in this modern world, there's so much trust. We have to have so much trust that you know the people who make our Twinkies aren't putting you know something awful in this filling. Uh, we just have to trust that you know, and uh, we live in a world of trust. And honestly, uh, trust isn't so bad. Trust is a good thing. You can maybe go a little overboard in uh, paranoia. I think I agree. Trust a little bit. It's hey, thank you, John. I appreciate street, it. Though. Little yeah. trust goes a long way. Yeah, a little trust goes a long way. <laughs> thank you, John. Appreciate it. That's one of the reasons I think people should learn how to code. Um, it's and even if you don't really compile all your own software, it's good to learn that. I yeah. Knowing Arch Linux, a bit you about do it. that. Uh, Tails Cube. He was he was using Arch. Uh, all of those allow you. In fact, Arch has a big whole section on reproducible builds uh, that they talk about what's reproducible and what you shouldn't use. Um, anyway, that that's a fun question. How do you know that you're safe? You don't. You really don't. If The only way to really be private and safe is to move to a cabin in the woods, <laughs> chop your own wood for heat. I don't know how you get your water. Uh, put out cat rain catches for the water. Um and uh, don't, whatever you do, get on the internet. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, when it comes to VPNs, um, having a nation state do an audit, <laughs> a raid and an audit of your VPN, as uh, happened with ExpressVPN, uh, tends to be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A sponsor of the network, we should mention. Yeah. We love ExpressVPN. Um, yeah, that happened in Turkey. They were looking for a murder suspect, and they just took the servers they didn't knock they just came in and said give us those servers stop keep your hand hands up <gasps> off the keyboard don't press any buttons don't press any buttons we're taking the servers there was nothing on nothing them. on them <laughs> they couldn't do anything with it uh so that's a good sign unless okay if you're really paranoid the turkish government was in cahoots Ooh, see that trust see, no one leo yeah i mean this is the problem it's you it's turtles all the way down it's <laughs> It's, it's untrustworthy, untrustworthy turtles. Untrustworthy turtles. Look at the way they look at you. Just so let's, untrustworthy. <laughs> let's do another one. That was fun. <laughs> oh, and by the way, if you have a uh, question, remember that you need to look towards the bottom of your UI, the user interface, for a little hand. You want to click that hand and raise it to let us know you have a question. Like lonely, elderly... <laughs> Man, I don't know. Should we take lonely elderly man? That sounds like uh, let's uh we I think we'll go to the phone call, right? Let's do the phone call. Or uh oh, do we have another phone call? Yeah, I see a phone. Unless that's a fake. John oh see Can now I've got it? me paranoid yeah. and I don't know All what right. to who to trust. We're going, we're going to voicemail. Should I trust okay. you? Oh, we trust that because we okay. pre listened to it. Go ahead. Hi, Leo and Micah. It's uh Erica from Tucson. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about uh, the NFC chips and using them uh, to log on to a Wi-Fi. Uh, I've gone through the process and have uh, chips that work with my iPhone, uh, but it seems that the Wi-Fi application doesn't work. I can read the chip and see the information there, but the iPhone doesn't actually uh, go to a Wi-Fi uh, login. Looking at uh, Google, I'm seeing a lot of entries indicating that while this works well on Android, mm -hmm. it's not yet enabled on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if I'm missing something or if that uh, feature indeed is not available on the iPhone. If you had listened Thanks. carefully, 
you would have heard Micah say it doesn't work on the iPhone. <laughs> yes. So unfortunately, that is uh, something that was available at one point briefly in a beta uh, and then was no longer available again. Apple's concerned about security. Apple says it's concerned about security. Uh, some would argue it is simply locking down the NFC as much as possible. But I think there is some you know, trust no one. There is some semblance to understanding that, yeah, if I tapped my phone and it automatically connect me, connected me to a Wi-Fi network that was then gobbling up a bunch of my information and I didn't realize it, that is kind of troublesome. But again, I, I, there's an argument made for both sides. But in yes, other words, it, it, doesn't, it work. doesn't work. This is why we recommend, and we, we talked about uh, using QR codes. Mm -hmm. See, I have a QR code on my camera. Um, I use, these are ping tags, but after I showed the ping tags, remember I put them on everything, my keys, yeah. my phone, my, oh, no. my cameras, uh, somebody, no, no, no. Oh, somebody okay. pointed out that Tile is also now doing that. Tile makes those Bluetooth trackers and they now have introduced the same idea uh, as, now I haven't tried it, so I don't know if it works exactly the same as the ping tags. I've been very happy with a ping tag, pingtag.com, but Tile now has uh, something that they call well, they call them stickers. Not the most complicated. Are they uh, NFC? Oh no, this is not. This is not it. No, they're uh, they have QR codes. Got it. Where are they? Mm -hmm. Maybe they stopped doing it. Somebody emailed me and said, you know, Tile does these QR codes too. You know, the stickers are NFCs. Oh yeah, Tile lost and found labels. Lost and found labels. Yes. So uh, I I'll have to do some investigation to see if this is the same as a ping tag. You buy a three pack of labels for $15. Uh, the idea is, uh, now this is for lost and found, you scan it, but we put up, uh, so we've got people coming in the studio. Mm -hmm. We put up a QR code, big QR code on the front door. As you come in, it says scan this to join our Wi-Fi, And that works on iPhone and Android and everywhere else. So instead of an NFC tag, which honestly, I think most people are now more used to QR codes than they are NFC tags. Uh, instead of an NFC tag, I would just put up a, a QR code or, you know, make it a little label. It doesn't have to be like this tile lost and found. It could just be you make it yourself. There are quite a few open source QR code uh, makers online. And there are also some non-open source that are, you know, I, I would actually prefer going with somebody who's, who's, doing it uh open source because sometimes they'll send it through a server or whatever and they can do some monitoring so uh but adobe offers a free online qr code de uh, generator uh, i see quite a few uh online but i would maybe look for one that's open source i found one that's written in python <laughs> that nice. i can run locally um and uh then i know nobody's getting talk about paranoid <laughs> then i know nobody's getting any of that information that i'm making in the qr code uh, it's, it's called QR code. Good name. 7.4.2. Does what it says on the tin. I love that. Does what it says on the tin. Uh, it's on PyPy, which is the, uh, Python library. So you just do a pip install QR code and now you can make uh, QR codes. You have to have Python installed in your machine, but almost all machines, it's easy to install Python. So that's nice because you're doing it locally. You generate a QR code. You could print an, on an Avery label. You could say anything no not any sudden movement i think there's an alien in our tv you can print on a, a sticker uh you could put it up as we do a, a sheet of uh, paper up on the wall yeah. um i think you know that's probably the easiest thing to do if you are run an airbnb or you let your house out or you have friends staying with you for the weekend just put a little sticker on the table or whatever and they can they'll everybody now knows that you know scan them because every code. restaurant yep. during covid exactly did their Menu, menus that all, way all that yeah. way so, uh, yeah, I've used this QR code in Python and it, because it's open source, I can look at the code. I can know it's not sending anything at the home office. It's just generating a QR code. Exactly. Yeah. So that's my suggestion. And yes, you were right. Apple doesn't allow it. Like we said, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I it's don't fine. listen it's either. <laughs> <laughs> half the time, Micah says something and I repeat it. <laughs> Right? And then the other I half, I am worried I'm going to repeat something that you say, so yeah. that I just don't we're say. We're busy it. doing our own thing yeah, here. You know, we got what we're splitting, splitting the work. Split, We've got one pile. brain cell to share between the exactly. two. Exactly. <laughs> our pile is coming up in just a little bit, but I think we can do. Uh, should I do an email, or you want to do a call? What do you want to do? Let's do a break.
a break. To a break. What a novel thought. You're watching Ask the Tech Guys. That there is Micah Sargent. I am Leo Laporte. Thank you for joining us. Um, did you see the latest? I almost ordered one. I know you're getting one. Yes. I'm glad because once again, see, this is what I love about you, Leo, is that you <laughs> get to be the person who tries things before I do so I can decide if I want to spend my money on them. The day that Kobo announced a color <laughs> e-reader with pen, like that morning, Micah texts me, uh, can you buy that so we can look at it? I said, I already did. <laughs> you already had bought already it. Did. it. I already got great. it. It's on its way. It comes at the end of the month. Oh. <sighs> Uh, you didn't text me this, but I you didn't. probably didn't have to. I uh, know because I actually heard you moments afterwards say on, I think it was MacBreak Weekly at the time or even Windows Weekly. I don't remember, but you said moments after I learned about it, I ordered this and I thought, okay, good. We're good. Well, uh, I know the it? guy who does the marketing, Stammy. He's an old friend. And I, I feel like this is probably going to be very interesting. The idea is it's a little pin you wear that records everything. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't record people without their permission if it uses voice print identification. So if I'm sitting talking to you and it doesn't know who you are, I have to explicitly say, hey, Micah, can I record this conversation? And if you say yes, it adds Micah and the voice print and it will it will record you. I was so, wondering about the consent aspect. Of yeah, it. that's, that's cool. really clever. The, I, the thing that we know about AI is it's really good at making transcriptions of voice, right? And it's also good at taking those transcriptions and summarizing them, perhaps doing action items, that kind of thing. Um, or if you're a husband and wife solving a fight, it's that instant replay yes. thing, right? Oh my, okay, that, okay, okay, okay. Here's, this is <laughs> you going want to, it now, don't you? This is going to solve, but also n like break a bunch of relationships because no one will be able to gaslight anyone anymore. Right. That's fantastic. Honey, you said, you did say well, let's this, honey. check the instant replay. <laughs> oh, you're right, I did say I've got receipts. So this comes in August or late August, but it got me thinking. I've got an Apple Watch. It has a very good microphone on it. Mm -hmm. It has, you know, I have just press record or voice memos, a variety of apps. In fact, I have just press record on here, which when I press it, immediately starts recording. And it then sends it to iCloud and transcribes it. So I'm halfway there already. And I don't have to ask your permission, which That's is illegal. It's but I don't have to ask your permission. So... I'm recording right now. See, it says it's recording. So, so wait, but you haven't been, have you been recording this whole day? Maybe. You have to tell me if you're a cop, otherwise it's entrapment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just started. So <laughs> there's, I just have to speak to this. Um, there's a new show on Netflix called Baby Reindeer. And I won't get into it because people should watch it, but it, it, it's about stalking. And oh dear. Um, who, who knew how recording could play a role in, yeah. yeah, could have an impact there. Well, get ready, because this is going to be a big, a difficult thing to enforce, and yeah. it's going to be universal. Uh, I've already, there's already a company that sells a credit card size device that you put up on lectures or whatever, does exactly this. It records it, transcribes it, sends it to an AI for summary, and then you get a, you know, the information back. Mm -hmm. I have to say, though, there is that privacy concern. Yeah. But used, in, I think, thoughtfully, how useful is that? See, because this is the thing. I I do not like the idea of committing to things and then forgetting about those commitments, exactly. whether they're small or big, whether, you know, they could be anything. I really want to be a person of my word. And so to, you know, accidentally let let that lapse, I love the idea of saying, okay, I can go back and I said I would do this and I said I would do that. And what was that conversation I was having? And also just, here's the thing. I have thoughts all the time that I could just say out loud and suddenly that's being dictated back and I would be able to look at that later and go, right, I did have that great idea. Uh, I think it's going to be very cool. I honestly will probably, even before you get this, I'll probably end up getting one just because I, I, but that is the thing for me, Leo, is I do have a little bit of concern about oh, yeah, there's a the huge privacy concern. Yeah. And I don't know if I quite feel comfortable wearing this around other people without full and true transparency and well, you that need a hat seems difficult. That has a sign that says I'm recording <laughs> I'm this. I'm recording this. I don't know if that would count legally, but it certainly would be a, a notice 
Everything yeah. is. And I think, honestly, look, we're already in that situation where uh, every school, this is a problem in schools. The kids have smartphones. Mm -hmm. Every fight, every, yeah, every everything little thing. Is, is recorded. Uh, you know, my kids grew up with relative privacy, but this generation can pretty much assume that there is somebody with a camera that could be recording everything they do when they're in public. Yeah. And I think that we're going to rapidly get to that in the next few years where we just assume that audio is being recorded at all times. Yeah, because it's it's already the case that we don't have a, there's not really a reasonable right to privacy in public anyway. There's kind of an agreed upon right to privacy in public. But if you are out and about and you're in public there's only so much true protection that you have as an individual outside of just kind of somebody's comfort level. That's why uh, people can, you know, take video and photos and stuff like that out in public versus if you're at a private event, that kind of thing where they do have to get your consent, et cetera, et cetera. So the other thing I should mention, you know, I was, as I mentioned, visiting my mom, she has Alzheimer's. Um, and what that really <sighs> means for her, she's, she's very happy. She's it, she's 91. She has no physical ailments at all. She remembers everything that used to happen. She's unable to make new memories. Mm -hmm. And that's actually an interesting concept. Christopher Nolan's done a lot of that with Memento, remember, uh, and other of his uh, movies. The idea, what if you couldn't remember anything from moment to moment? Uh, and, you know, that's why she has to be in, in an assisted living facility because uh, people take care of her because she can't remember did i eat did i have i bathed what time of day is it she can't remember but she but what's interesting is she's 100 percent there uh, one of the things we do with her is show her old pictures and look at picture books she remembers every detail much more than i do so she her memory is great for things that happened before she got alzheimer's before she was able unable to make memories mm -hmm. but now that she can't make short-term memories nothing gets into the long-term memory or very little does um and so it's kind of every day is a fresh day, but imagine if she had a device recording and she had notes uh, that she could refer to. Yes. She could have an artificial memory in effect. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's augmented memory. And I was also thinking of this. How cool is this? You have uh, someone you're taking care of. They go to the doctor on their own. But now you can look through that and exactly. see what the doctor actually said. That's a very good use. That for it. would be amazing. In fact, every time I go to the doctor from now on, yes. I'm going to say, "Can I record this?" Because yes. that would you want to remember all those details, and it's hard to, you know, especially when he's telling you bad news. So uh, I think that this is going to be more and more prevalent. We know this is something uh, AI is very good at: is taking this text, transcribing it assigning voices to it and then analyzing it. And I imagine you'll have custom prompts. So you could say, look, I, Micah will say, anytime I agree to do something, please, please. make a note of that, yep. add it to my to-do list. I want, uh, maybe Rosemary could write a script that would take record. So I've got halfway there. Uh -huh. I got a ability to record. It goes to iCloud, yeah. which means it's also available on my Mac. Then, And it's transcribed. This actually, uh, Just Press Record, does a very good job of transcribing. So what I'd like to do is get the transcripts to ChatGPT or to some other AI yeah, for analysis. Yeah, through an API, which could be probably, AI. There's, have you uh, heard of make.com? I think you could probably build something. Exactly, like yeah. Well, I know you can because I have friends who do this. <laughs> I told you the yeah, story. Yeah, Doc Rock actually does, yeah. does something so like that. So I this. think that this, so you may not need the limitless pin yeah. because you really probably could do it all with a with a Apple Watch. Or, but it's so slick, that <laughs> and, and it's a visible pin and yeah. people, it has a light on it when it's recording and it so It feels forth. more It's a little honest. more alerts people yeah. that I am recording this and I can and, and it won't record unless you ask permission. And so everybody will stay away from me, which is great. Yeah, which is also, also okay. <laughs> all right, time to talk space with our spaceman. Rod Pyle is here. He's the host of This Week in Space along with Tarek Malik of space.com. Rod is... The uh, editor in chief of the I of the official publication of the uh, something something science. You want me to finish? Yes. Yeah, would you please? <laughs> it's Ad Astra for the National Space Society, our fine quarterly magazine. Love it. Author many many books, and he's on his way to. Uh, I don't know. Are you on your way to Alpha Centauri these days? I think uh, Zeta Reticuli for this trip, oh. because that's how far I would have to go to actually win an argument with nice significant other with a recording. And if you think that Lisa's <laughs> going to let you get away with that, 
I just don't think so, but that's just me. I love uh, the smoothies they have at Zeta Reticuli. They're the best. I, there's no better. And then there's a restaurant at the end of the universe, which is, <laughs> True. there's nothing like it. Um, you know, I tried to wear a hat today in celebration of you, but it went out of camera, so it wasn't very interesting <laughs> okay. looking. Now, sure. I want to know, Rod, given the... Yeah, oh, look at that, a top hat. <laughs> given the yeah. speed with which those stars are moving, can you yes. tell me what the speed of travel you're at? It's probably multiple times the speed of light, I'm guessing. Uh, I think it's warp glorp. Warp glorp. Warp glorp. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's as technical as I can get. You know me, I'm not Mr. Technical. We're so, hey. waiting for uh, Thursday, next Thursday, uh, for the Stacy's Book Club. And I and I, I yeah. forgot how much I love this book. We're reading uh, Dennis Taylor's uh, incredible We Are Legion, the first book in the Bobaverse series. Have you read any of those? No, no I started, uh, I guess it was that first book. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I had some trouble with it. So you I lost interest. Huh? But I will go back. Well, it happens, you know. One of the things I liked yeah. about it, uh, it's a lot about AI, Mm. It's not a spoiler because this happens in the first chapter. The guy uh, dies and they cut off his head because he paid for it ahead of right. time. Right. He you paid know, to have his head cut to off? To be frozen oh, like after Walt his death. Disney. Yeah. yeah, like Walt Disney. And uh, and then and he Tupac. wakes up 117 years later and they've taken his head and they've turned it into an AI. So he's in a he's in a, in a machine. He's uh -huh. actually an AI. But what he becomes is a von Neumann probe. And this is a fascinating concept. The idea is you could explore the universe with AI-driven probes that had built in the ability to reproduce themselves using 3D printers. So when they arrive at a planet, the first thing they do is gather resources, build some copies, send them off, and they can slowly multiply and spread throughout the universe. And it's a great, it's a wonderful concept, and that's why... The book is called We Are Legion and why he is in the Bobaverse because there are many Bobs by the time we get to the end of the book. It's a wonderful book. If you have read it or you want to read it, read it and uh, join us Thursday for Stacy's Book Club and we will uh, talk a little bit about it. So you didn't like That's it. That's for huh? club members, right? Yeah, club members. Well, you're a club member. Yeah. You can, you can. Yeah, but I just, just, just you know, put for, the ad out there yeah, for everybody for else to make sure they join. Club members, join the club. Yeah. Yep. We can, we can still have a club. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll get back to it. I, it. As I recall, it was kind of an interruption. Um, yeah, you should read you, it. I think it's quite amusing. I think it's really fun and funny. It's in this kind of the vein of The Martian, maybe because Ray Porter's reading it. It's a great audible book. Uh, Ray Porter does all the voices, including one of the Bobs who's decided. They all have to have different names to avoid confusion. One of the Bobs has named himself after Homer Simpson and talks like this. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> it's very good in an audio book. Anyway, what's going on? In space. Well, in space. You mentioned probes beyond the solar system, and we have a little bit of additional information Feature. about Voyager 1. Feager. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's just set the backstory. Voyager 1 was launched in 1977, so that's 46-ish years ago. It's currently 15 billion miles away from Earth. One-way radio messages take 22 and a half hours to get out there. So it's it's you know, it's out on the extreme edge of human presence for sure and voyager one was the one that flew past jupiter saturn and saturn's moon titan and then was ejected out of the solar system to the north of the ecliptic whereas voyager 2 continued going out to the outer planets um so in december last year it started sending back gibberish jpl pings it every now and then to say how are you doing and it sent back a bunch of code that didn't make any sense and they went uh oh so they uh looked for a carrier tone which it sends and so they can they can instruct the carrier tone to modulate itself to let us know that it still heard us, but the data it was sending was bad. So about two weeks ago, they announced that they think they figured out it's uh, corrupted memory in a single chip in a flight computer. And it's worth bearing in mind, you know, if you have a chip way out there in the radiation-saturated outer solar system where you've got a lot more cosmic rays than you do in the inner solar system, and they have big heavy energetic particles, um, one of those particles can come flying through your chip and flip a bit or two and you've got problems. So their estimate is there's like a 3% corruption somewhere. Oh, Anthony, bless you for pulling those up. I was going to send them to you, but you did it already. And um, that that's the problem. So they think they could do a workaround, but it'll take a couple of months. However, at this point, over half of its instruments are shut down anyway. And while you know, we anthropomorphize these things. We love the Voyagers. 
they're the leading edge of human presence, as I said, but the RTGs on them, the nuclear power supplies, are probably good for another three to four years. They're they're barely sending back enough wattage to track now. So we may be looking at a few more years before they got to be shut down. Part of the reason we love them is because they've kind of exceeded their mission, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. They're <laughs> supposed to, well, it's like all this stuff that JPL does. Well, we'll give you a warranty for three years. Or in the case of uh, op the, uh, the um, Opportunity Rover, that was supposed to last 90 days, and it lasted 14 years. So JPL does spectacular stuff, which is why it was kind of a shock earlier this week. NASA held a press conference about this much beleaguered Mars sample return mission and basically said, and I'm I'm paraphrasing greatly, but basically said, JPL, you're too expensive. You're That's too slow. That's so frustrating. This drives me talk nuts. To industry. Well, and you know, the problem is if you're the if samples are NASA collected. Field center, they're there. They're sitting yes. on Mars waiting for and, a mission. And we knew this was going to happen yeah. because this mission wasn't approved before they right. they you know set up how they're going to do this. And it's what's infuriating is, you know, the way the setup works, if you want to get a budget through NASA and pass Congress, you either have to deliberately bid low and then have it go up or be honest and have your your mission not approved. So it's it was bid originally a lot cheaper. Costs have gone up, of course. And, you know, can private industry do it? I don't know. They haven't even been able to land successfully on no. the moon yet. So it seems like going to Mars and grabbing <laughs> rocks is going to be a far stretch. The other problem is, at this point, you know, JPL is flying out uh, the remainder of the life of the Mars rovers and orbiters. They've got a Venus mission, and they've got uh, Europa Clipper, and a couple other smaller things, but that's about it. So if they don't continue feeding that field center work, you start losing the brain trust, and you lose all these brilliant people. There's a wonderful... It feels like they're being strangled documentary about the team now remember voyager was launched in 1972 and the team that launched voyager is still running it but they're all our yeah. age rod <laughs> they're all and older and older well so that's ed stone so he's probably in his mid 80s he's still the, yeah I that picture of him is back in 72 yeah yeah there we go now yeah. we're getting there yeah yeah so and it's this, a real small crew it is it's a handful of people it's a wonderful documentary because it's just in a little they have a little storefront in Pasadena or somewhere that right. uh, used to be a dentist's office. It's just a handful of them, but they're running this longest. This is the farthest a human craft has ever gone away from Earth. They're running this mission. <laughs> there are just a handful of them left. It's a wonderful. It's called It's Quieter in the Twilight, and uh, it, uh -huh. it's available on your streaming. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago wonderful story and I, actually it, during that story uh, one of the first crises uh, uh hits voyager one and they have to shut down some uh, features because their batteries aren't keeping enough power going it's a really yeah, so it, beautiful story not, not to get carried away but the interesting thing to me about the rtgs so these are radioisotopic generators and they have a plug of plutonium in there that's got a half-life of 87 years but it's surrounded by thermocouples and over time, you know, these bimetal things, over time, they apparently start growing little hairs towards each other uh. and they get small shorts. These get micro shorts. And that's what uh, ends up causing them to not last you know, oh. the, the full span of time. But you they said could. they were only supposed to last seven years and they've lasted quite a few more. Yes. The probes. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the original estimate. Anyway. Here is uh, one of the shots from It's Quieter in the Twilight. Voyager, mission critical hardware, please do not touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was, so they moved away from that old dentist's office and brought it back up to JPL. Oh, did they? Still, oh, good. Oh, good. But it's still, it's like, you know, 12 people or 10 people and a banquet table and a couple of old, I think their son workstations. Oh, yeah, are, because, uh, you know, from this. It's from all the from that era. It's and amazing, they though, who what know they're how doing. to use that software. Oh, it is. They're able to communicate with this. How long, what is the. What is the lag? What is the latency? How far out? It's billions of miles and a half out. hours each way. Wow. So it's 45 hours round trip to get a command out there. And wow. and let's not forget, you know, their data recorder is a tape recorder. It's not a drive. 
It's not a disc. This it's is a 1972 technology. So it's like my, my Commodore VIC-20, you oh. know, with its little tape drive or something. Oh, man. So it's, you know, just the fact that they're still working out there. And, and it's a hostile environment, you know. They're just amazing machines. And if you ever get a chance to do even the small tour of JPL, which is where they, it's kind of a hassle to get in, but they take you into the main auditorium. But they've got probably, I don't know, 15 spacecraft in there hanging from the ceiling on the walls. They've got a Voyager engineering twin there, and they're huge. They're if I go down and I say I know Rod Pyle, if I don't wear this hat, will they let me in? No, they'll call security on me. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to do that. I know you used to but, work there. You used to do a, a PR for them, right? I did PR, and then I did this yearly uh, technology highlights book that was really great oh, that's fun. Right. Yeah. It was 30 stories of their coolest stuff, but, you know, the cutbacks came, and that's a soft a soft sure. project, so that was the easy one to get rid of. Yeah, But I still got a few copies of the old one, but I, I'm hoping it'll come back. You know, it's just NASA's operating under this dumb continuing resolution that makes funding uncertain and, you know. And, and, and just one more small thing. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but JPL is the only NASA field center that isn't staffed by civil servants. NASA pays Caltech to manage JPL. So they're Caltech employees, which is a whole different structure. And for better or worse, that makes them easier to dismiss than if they're civil servants. So um, I think that's why we see so many cutbacks happening there. So that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, I know we have some JPL scientists who listen uh, to our shows. Um, I've talked to them in the past. And, of course, we appreciate what they do and what you do, Ron. Ron. Oh, what's his name? Ron oh, Pyle. Ron Pyle. That's, yeah. that's because who Rod has already landed on the other planet. We're yeah. talking Dr. to <laughs> the evil yeah. twin, Ron. <laughs> Ron, Ron well, and, and, Pyle. You know, all I do is go up there and listen to the smart people and try and write down what they say so the rest of us can understand it. But you're right. I mean, it's a real incredible environment up there and i think because the Cal caltech connection it's a little more of a college campus feel but working with those people is just such a pleasure and it, it really took a, a bite out of my heart when they had those cutbacks and i'm sure you know everybody there too <sighs> this week in space every week uh now open to the public we uh, started it in the club and it was such a success it's available uh internet wide uh just search for this week in space in your podcast client or visit twit.tv slash TWIS for all the episodes. Uh, thank you, Rod. It's always thank nice. you, sir. And you're rocking that hat. I want to see one on Micah next week. <laughs> I'll get him one. Actually, I have uh, this is from the American hat maker as opposed to somebody else. So it's a very handsome hat. I think it's not. My Lisa got it. It is a very me. handsome hat. Yeah, Lisa got it for me. That's kind of like Stetson quality, right? I mean, it's the real thing. It's not. Uh, no, it's I don't know if it's the real thing. It's certainly uh, made out of leather. <laughs> That's a real thing. That's a sweat catcher. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank uh, you, right, gentlemen. Thank you, Rod. Thank you so much. I could wear this in space probably if I had the right face mask. And tell your brother, Ron, we said hello. <laughs> now you know why I ordered that AI pin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you know why, could you tell me? Because I forgot. Yeah, I'll let you. Um, <laughs> you're watching uh ask the tech guys uh 888-724-2884 is the phone number yep you can leave a message if you're uh, if you call in when we're not on the air otherwise if you call between what is it 2 and 5 p.m uh eastern on sundays we're here and we'll, we'll answer we'll answer who should we talk to uh, next mr well, let's take a, a either then uh, we got a wireless caller on the line a wireless caller coming up as ask the tech guys continues this is mike over there i'm leo laporte i got hat hair <laughs> the only thing i you know i love hats that's why i don't like. but i don't hats. like hat hair yeah is there a solution for that is there a hat that doesn't give you hat hair that somebody should make it because that's a hat i'd wear i buy that hat I basically have a choice between wearing a hat or not wearing a hat. There is yeah. no wearing a hat and then later not doing it. That's why so many of the people who wear hair. hats don't have hair. There you go. There you That's go. the explanation. That's the solution. Welcome back to Ask the Tech Guys. Let's see. Who's next? A wireless caller. Hello. Hey, Hello. welcome. What's your first name? This is Dan from Fresno. Hi, Dan. Welcome. What's up? Uh, thanks, man. Well, um, I have a question about a wireless hotspot 
using an iPhone 15 Pro Max. Um, I'm not at home. I'm at a friend's house because I'm having work done on my house. Okay. Uh, but she doesn't have any kind of internet here. So I'm trying to use um, my hotspot with my computer. Um, I have Xfinity Mobile, and I've had them since October. Um, but when I connect, it lets me connect and everything. I can connect. But once I do anything, like say I check my email, mm -hmm. it immediately disconnects me. <laughs> That's useful. <laughs> yeah. so, it, well, exactly. It's so weird because if I look at my phone so at that point, I can still stream. It's not like I don't have internet. I can still stream stuff. I oh, can, really? You know, uh, so Paramount you can Plus, receive, but you YouTube. can't. You're thinking you can't send, but the truth I, I, is I'm, you can't receive without sending. It's kind of like the natural it's, yeah, law. Right. It, it, so it, we know you're sending. If you're able to it, stream it, anything, you're sending. Right. So I can, I can, um, I can get, get on the internet. Like I said, on the computer, I can, I can do something and immediately drops the connection. If I go into my, my system tray and look for the internet connection. It says there's no internet connection. Phone. So what is it that but causes iPhone, the internet connection to drop? What actual activities cause it to drop? You can look at well, YouTube. The, it, it seems as if it seems as if if I stop doing something, then it, it goes away. Like if I check my email, it connects and everything. I get it, but right after that, if I go to try and load a web page, it tells me there's no internet. Uh, so it almost la it lasts for a, a moment and then it stops. Right. If, and you said if, you're using Xfinity. Now, let me ask you a question about Xfinity. One of the ways mm -hmm. Xfinity works, it's very frustrating to me, is they, uh, if you're an Xfinity customer and you're using the Xfinity router on your internet, is they actually create a, an open hotspot. It's called Xfinity. I hate that thing. I know, that people can use. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's unless you turn it off, you're helping other people. Now that's fine. They say it doesn't come, it doesn't cost you. It doesn't kind of cost uh, you know you any money. It doesn't take away bits from your downloads and so forth. But the wireless works that way. So they do fall back to Verizon. But if you're within mm -hmm. a hotspot, if you can, if that phone can see an Xfinity hotspot, it says, I'm not going to use Verizon because it costs them when you use right. Verizon. I'm going to use that hotspot. Well, let me tell you this. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you this too. Um, so, so say I try using just the the the, the, the Xfinity Mobile, the cellular data to get the hotspot. Right. It it does the same thing. Okay. So my where I'm at right now, the neighbor has one of these open hotspots. Aha. So if I lean right up against the, the, my neighbor's wall, you know, the, right up against the wall, I can get their Xfinity hotspot. Right? right. But it does the same thing. If if I connect to the internet on the computer. As soon as I do something right after that, it, it drops. Do they, ch I don't know this it, about Xfinity. It do they charge you extra for hotspotting or do they say hotspotting is, is part of your plan? It's, it's, it's part of my plan. It's part of the, the, the unlimited plus plan that I have. Okay. So I it says like 15 gigs of hotspot. Okay, good. Okay. This is, this is bizarre mm -hmm. to me that it, it disconnects right afterward. Is it just this one computer? Have you tried it with your neighbor? I can't remember if you said you're at your neighbor's or your friend's house. Have you tried another device to hotspot with? And is it I, ha something? I haven't. I don't have another device here. Okay. Um, because we've that's, had this... That's the only problem I have This is a that. Windows machine, right? Yes. So I remember a similar issue with a Windows PC where it ended up being an energy saver issue yeah that the wi-fi card kept dropping right after it, it will do, do that something. sometimes you have to go into the device manager and turn off sleep yeah on the network cards <gasps> oh and here's the other thing on the network uh, card yeah i know that windows has a feature where it can recognize when it's using something like a mobile connection and it will automatically do what's called metering yeah it's called a meter connection, uh, because yeah. it, it it thinks that oh dear you might use too much and so we're going to protect it so that might actually be what's happening here is you run that email thing once and it's running up against the meter and so then it's disconnecting right after that so you might check in your that's the thing about windows is we don't know necessarily which wi-fi card you have etc cetera, etc cetera, but you might look around in your uh, -huh. uh network settings to see if there's something that is marking it as a metered connection and then turn off that metered connection. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, by default, Windows sets okay. Wi-Fi to non-metered. Oh, it does. But mobile broadband networks, by default, it sets to oh, metered. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah. So what you probably want to do is turn off uh, metered. So here's how: uh, swipe in from the right edge of the screen, select Settings, Change PC Settings, choose Network, select Connections, and then under Data Usage, turn on or off Set as metered connection. So that's ridiculous. I know it's so involved. <laughs> um, it, it could be that it also could be Xfinity <laughs> is is uh, is weird. Is I'm kicking gonna, you for some reason? I'm gonna. No, uh, the one time that I did get it, the one time I did get it to actually last for a while. Mm -hmm. What I actually ended up having to do was was load a YouTube video, you know, like a playlist. And keep it running. And at that point, it's it kept it running. Do you have low power mode turned on on your iPhone? No. Okay, that's interesting. That, that so, in other words, something. by keeping something running in the background, and, and this is on the phone or that's on the window, on the on the, on the Windows, thing. yeah, on the phone or on the Windows PC, where, on the Windows machine. Okay, on the Windows machine. So this may be is what you yeah. were talking about with the where the card is for some reason going to sleep, mm -hmm. and and keeping the YouTube oh, running is is constantly pushing the card, so the network says, oh no no, you're still working. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is a. Strange. It's very strange. Dang thing here. Let me that just... is incredibly frustrating because I'd go to do something and I just had no more internet. And I have to restart everything to get it go back up and going again. You're not using a VPN, are you? <laughs> no. Okay. No. Um, I, you know, it's in the network and internet settings. Are right, Windows 10 or Windows 11? 11. Okay, that's what I'm using here. Let me go to the internet option. Look how small that is. I can't even oh, read yeah, that. Yeah, why is it so tiny? That is also a good question. Um, when you so you do something and then it, you wait a couple of seconds in the network settings, are you still connected to the network and it just says that there's no longer internet connection, or does it completely disconnect from the network as a whole? So so what what so when I go to system pray when I have when it's working it says connected to Dan you know to my Daniel's iPhone uh -huh. internet you know that's where but when it loses it it just says no internet okay so see it says no internet that it could still be connected mm -hmm. but just not have internet the reason why I'm asking is because that can help us narrow down if it's coming from the Windows side or the iPhone side uh, if it completely right. loses connection entirely then that's more likely to be on the iPhone side, but it sounds like this is definitely on the Windows PC side. I don't think it's the iPhone because I, I went as far as connecting the USB the USB cable to to the computer mm -hmm. and connecting the, the connecting the internet that way. You know, not using the the, the wireless because option, in the right. iPhone it actually says that you can you can do it wired. Yep, USB so tethering. I tried doing it that way, thinking, yeah. But I thought, well, maybe that'll remove any possibility that it, there's a problem with the iPhone because it's not, it's going through the cable now. It's not going through mm -hmm. what other, you know, uh, if that's on the iPhone, it's going through the cable. Yeah. But it still did it. Yeah. It's a great troubleshooting step. So, uh, so props on that, on, on attempting. This is, this is a real thinker. I, I have to say my experience I with, uh, I'm an Xfinity customer to my, much to my sadness i am not an xfinity wireless customer but i have to say one of the things i find is that many of those xfinity wi-fi hotspots that i want are around are unreliable and i'm thinking that maybe this is part of the problem is that neighbor's xfinity hotspot the phone when as soon as it sees it says oh forget verizon i've got a i've got a wi-fi hotspot mm -hmm. and joins it i wouldn't get closer to it i would get farther from it because i th well see but it's a weird thing that it it doesn't either way, though. Even if it's it doesn't on either way. G or yeah, because I really, I don't, I think that my experience is when I'm wandering about, I make sure I do not join any Xfinity Wi-Fi. Yeah, because oh it's my. always bad. It's, ugh. it's something. It's, it's not that it's bad, you know. And it's, I, I've it's, gone as far as turning off Wi-Fi, and it still happens. You know, so it doesn't try and join anything, and it still happens. So you're on Verizon for sure. Um, now I'm mm -hmm. now I'm a little Remember. bit puzzled. I would look at this metered uh, connection thing. Yeah, it's, definitely check here it that. is in the network and internet settings. I'm on Ethernet, so it's under Ethernet. But for you, it would be uh, under Wi-Fi. But you'll see there's metered connection, 
and you you want to make sure that that's off. This is where I wish that we had uh, AI bot where I could ask it the whole history of Ask the Tech Guys because I remember an episode where we were talking to someone and we found out that one specific Wi-Fi card was just a bad card. Right. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, it was the killer. The killer card. Card yeah. from, uh, in, I think it's Intel. Yeah, we, and we they were on a Dell system that had a killer. So you don't need an AI. You just need my, just need Leo's my cowboy memory. hat brain. <laughs> um, yeah, the killer cards are bad. But uh, could be that. I mean, could be that I would. That's the other thing, and I would go into the um, the uh, device settings on that network card and make sure sleep is turned off. That's for sure. Um, you know how okay. to get to the device manager. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you're going to go and look at that particular uh, uh, internet card, and uh, you know I'm on a, a virtual machine, so I won't actually have a hardware uh, internet card here. So. Well, let me just see network adapters. Yeah, it's all it's all uh, virtualized, so I I can't really. But you'll go into yeah, okay. uh, device manager, network adapters. You'll choose that Wi-Fi adapter. You'll go to properties, and you'll see somewhere in here that there is the ability to sleep. Turn that off. You don't want to sleep. You want that thing to always be on. That's a common issue for uh, a okay. lot of Windows users. I, and after that, I don't uh -huh. know. I don't know. I honestly, I want to blame everybody. I hate, I, I hate Xfinity. <laughs> want to blame them. Not a fan of Windows. Want to blame uh, Windows. Uh, the one who makes the card. Want to blame them. Could be, could be the iPhone. For all I know, uh, this is a such a complicated well, setup. Just, that's what I wasn't sure. You it's know, so weird that it it works and then iPhone. it drops. Yeah, that's... works and it drops. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and email. See, and you, yeah. you mentioned you know email. That can be a, a relatively heavy. Uh, bit of, of data grabbing. That's what made me think metered connection because yeah, when, when you hit that refresh button, depending on your email program, it might be pulling a lot of, of information and sending it back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only thing was is that it, like I said, it did stay on when I, when I loaded up that YouTube um, playlist, it stayed connected. So this... that's why I was thinking something, something was going to sleep or something weird like that. Yeah, this is a, a great article. Thank you, Quippy, from a site that I'm going to bookmark from now on called Rotten Wi-Fi. Why does Xfinity Wi-Fi hotspot keep disconnecting? <gasps> and in this case, it is because he's connect. You cannot see my computer. Is that the problem? No. Oh, yeah. The, the cable I fell it. out. Well, I, I got the, the little cable fell out. Uh, apparently, in this case, it's because of this public Wi-Fi network called Xfinity Wi-Fi that I was talking about. And there's a limit on how much you can use. So it's it's apparently very common to have connectivity problems when you're on an Xfinity hotspot. So, yeah, the neighbor's Wi-Fi is definitely something you don't want. Um, mm -hmm. There are some other things you can troubleshoot in here that are kind of interesting. Um, so I will put a link to this in the show notes, too. Thank you, Quippy, for this. And I like the name of this site. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start haunting this rotten wi-fi site <laughs> rotten rotten wi -fi. That wi -fi. Rotten wi -fi. <laughs> you know what really grinds my gears yeah, rotten wi-fi uh yeah we don't have a good solution yeah, for you turning off the hotspot yeah was the first thing you know yeah. at home i always turn that off yeah you don't like it and either a couple of times they, they've actually turned it back on on me and, ah. and, the, and the only reason i noticed is because yeah, and, and I noticed because my phone tries to connect to it. Right, and they want it and because that's like, what's... Nobody else. The whole idea that Xfinity had, now other cable companies are copying, is, hey, we we got a lot of routers in town. We could be a mobile uh -huh. network if we just had enough routers open their Wi-Fi at, to the public, then we we could be a, a cellular company. They realized, of course, that, that wasn't going to work as soon as you got out of town, so they made a deal with Verizon. But they still don't want to use that Verizon. It costs them money. They want to use their hotspots. And I, it's just a terrible solution. I do not recommend a cable internet company as your mobile phone company. I just don't think that that technology is very mature. It works very well. It was it was a way of making money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which Xfinity mm -hmm. is very good at. Let me ask you this. <laughs> what, what, what do you guys think about Frontier Fiber? They just recently came into here where I live. I would do it. Well, I've, and... uh, Frontier, 
has a very checkered past. I mean, I've heard such bad things about Frontier, yeah. yeah. But I have heard good things about Frontier Fiber. So the history of Frontier is terrible. And they moved into Southern California, and they just, they just messed with people like crazy. And uh, Cory Doctorow has raged at them because they basically took government money to build out their network and never did, and on and on and on. But I hear very good things about Frontier Wi-Fi from a number of customers. So I'm mean, Frontier uh, Fiber. Uh, in fact, there's Scooter X saying Frontier Fiber is amazing. So I think I would put the history in the back mirror uh, and uh, say maybe review mirror and say maybe uh, I'll give them a chance with the fiber. Uh, everybody I know who has it likes it. Uh, so okay. there you go. So give that yeah, a they try. They recently laid, laid a bunch of fiber here in town. And, yeah, uh, I think when you can get fiber, you should get fiber. <laughs> Lisa and I are looking for stock and downsize our house. We want to. We're looking at ha smaller houses around town and, and oh, all, over in Sonoma. First thing I do, Amen. type in, can I get Sonic yeah. here? <laughs> First yes. thing I do. Uh, you know, she has other priorities. But for but, me, yes, uh, high-speed internet at a low cost is a great deal. Yeah, agreed. I think fiber is really, uh, if you can get it, is really the way to go. Uh, thank you for the call. Okay. I'm sorry we weren't much help, but we gave you All some right, ideas. You. We gave you some things to try. And keep listening because somebody might call in with some uh, a better idea because we got a lot of – that's the best thing about this show. It always has been. It's a community. When I started doing it 20 years ago, it's a community. We've always had great people in the chat room who help out, listeners who call in. Uh, it's not just us, the tech guys, answering your questions. It's it's this vast community of, uh, of uh, tech enthusiasts. All trying to answer. Yes, Scooter X says Frontier Fiber is amazing. Very happy customer in Southern California. Uh, it's been rock solid since I installed it a year and a half ago. The price is fair and it just works. Is this the same Scooter X? Is I know. This is a different Scooter X. Seems wow. awfully. It's very positive. Yeah. Awfully yeah. non grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love you, Scooter X. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Oh, April 24th. Chocolate Milk Mini Sip said this along. April 24th. Is that is it April 24th yet? No. Tomorrow, day after tomorrow <laughs> is JS Naked Day. Okay. Can we explain what that means? It's Obviously, the web JavaScript. should work without JavaScript. Got it. JS Naked Day promotes the rule of least power. Start with HTML and CSS and that's and then stop before you get to javascript. You know how few sites work without javascript? Very few sites. Very few sites work without javascript. But uh, it is naked JS naked day. JavaScript is like what? The earrings Three days. and cufflinks to an outfit? Yeah. It's which is fun. it's more like suspenders. Okay. Like it it you could probably get along without it, but many of us are pants that fall down. There you go. I like it. Yeah. What you're here for the metaphors? That's the and, metaphors and keep coming. The reminiscing. Uh, <laughs> now the Discord chat is saying, "No way, that's Scooter X." We have we have fun. <laughs> See, in trust the, no one. Trust no one. We have real fun in the uh, in the Discord chat. That's just one of the fa the faculties, the facilities, the things we provide you uh, as members of the club. We have all those club events coming up today. We're gonna have a live recording for club members. Stacy's Book Club is Thursday. And, of course, you record iOS Today in the club every Tuesday. Uh, and we're going to do that watch party. Are we still – Anthony's idea here, we're doing this yeah. May 9th. We're still doing Metropolis? Yeah. Or, yeah. We think the soundtrack is copyright. Yeah, because it was the movie. Uh, restored recently. Or, well, I mean, not recently, but relatively We'll recently. show a crappy old <laughs> 1927 print. Yeah, but that's missing like half an hour. Like, Oh. Yeah. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. You and I will act out the last we half hour. AI create the last half. Wouldn't that be funny? Yeah. Here's watch this hour and a half incomplete movie and provide us with the last half hour. I think that's a great idea. Anyway, it's going to be a watch along. We're going to do it. Uh, Lisa and I are going to do it at the house where much, much of the staff's going to join us. I'll be making brisket. Uh, and you can join us in the uh, Club Twit Discord. Sadly, no brisket in the Discord, but I haven't you figured can look out a way to it. do that yet. I'll show you brisket. We'll show you the brisket, but I can't give it to you to what eat. What is that? Mukbang? 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 <laughs> Not bang. Mukbang? I Muk, I th oh, I thought it was like ong, but maybe there it is bang. 
I don't know what you're talking about. It's where about. you, it's people Just watch eating. people eat. Yeah. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> anyway, I don't. No, hey, don't yuck people's yum. <laughs> don't mu yuck people's muck bung. Uh, <laughs> you keep saying bung and it's not bung. I'm telling you, it's definitely not that. <laughs> you said it. We're you said it. We're unclear. <laughs> Anyway, Don't Google it, guys. the it's, reason it's, we it's, do that is we want to make it fun to be in the club. And I think it is fun to be in the club. You get ad free versions of all the shows. You get uh, video of all the shows that we don't make video publicly available. For instance, Micah does this wonderful hands on Macintosh show. And for a long time, it was behind the paywall in the club only. We realized that's terrible. We want everybody to have access to it. So we thought, what could we do? And Lisa said, why don't we just put the audio out to the public? People can listen to it get the value of it, but if they want the video, they have to join the clubs. We want to give you some sort of reason to join the club. Now, it's only $7 a month, which I think is a is a pretty low, you know, there are many podcasts, the whole podcast, one podcast, seven bucks a month. We give you a bunch of podcasts, access to the Discord, ad-free versions of all the shows, Twit Plus content we don't put out anywhere else. But the main reason you should be doing this, by the way, the main point of this yeah, I'll bake biscuits. If you'll join the club, I'll bake biscuits. You can mukbang my biscuits. <laughs> anyway, uh, the main reason you join the club is because for some crazy reason, you think Mike and I should just keep doing what we're doing. Not just this show, but all the shows. You want to keep Jammer B employed and Anthony Nielsen employed and Benito and, and, and Sebastian and Debbie and all the people who work here, you want to keep the lights on, you want to keep the studio going, but we can't do that without your help because unfortunately, sad to say, uh, ad revenue is dwindling, audiences are dwindling, it's a very competitive environment, uh, and 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 we're just, you know, we're, we're giving it to you and saying, you want us to keep doing it, it's up to you. So twit.tv slash club twit. If you listen to more than one show a week, I think seven bucks is a very fair a bargain, and it really does help us Keep doing what we're doing. And we, I think I've recently, I don't know about you, but I've recently come to the opinion that tech, which was getting kind of a monotonous over the last few years, the iPhone just so dominant and everybody's just copying them. And it didn't seem like any really real innovation was happening. All of a sudden, AI happens and everybody's waking up and mm -hmm. things are happening. And I think it's going to be a very interesting next few years. And I really think it's important that we're here to give you unbiased coverage with no axe to grind no faith or no favor what do they how do they say that no something or favor we don't we just we're 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 giving you the straight facts and i think it's worth seven bucks a month so that we don't no fear or favor we don't have any fear or favor uh we just we just say tell it like it is and i think that's uh, going to be very valuable i think without fear or favor yes that's us mukbang it's called. Yeah, but I think the A is um Mukbun. Mukbun. It's uh or it's Korean, of course, and it's pronounced okay. <laughs> there you go. That's it. <laughs> it's an eating show, an online audiovisual broadcast. See, I'm not a fan of that. I wouldn't watch it, but some people love Some people it. love watching other people eat. And they eat. They What's the term? There is a term for a phobia uh, of eating oh, sounds. Yes. Um, People, or any mouth sounds. Or any mouth sounds. What is that? I don't know. But If I, you didn't ask me, I would know it. I, I, I know that there are many people who hate me because of that, my mouth sounds. Gosh darn it. I The the fear of God was put into me as a child with that. So don't, I don't chew with Don't smack my mouth your lips closed. and chew with your mouth closed, as you should. Yes. Amen. There's, oof. We are watching, mis yes, misophonia. Misophonia. Um, we were watching you. a show recently and they purposely, it was a, a reality show and they purposely made the mouth sounds of the people Disgusting. louder. Ugh. Yes. And for, for people who have that sensitivity, it's sometimes called sound rage. Yeah. Cause it will make them angry. Yeah. So yeah. It doesn't make me angry, I but I just think it's gross. I, there are people, cause I used to, you know, I'd bite an apple while I was on the radio and people get very upset. <laughs> <laughs> so you bit harder. <laughs> yeah, I bit harder. Let's move on to... That was our little break. Thank you for letting putting up with that. Uh, and thank you for joining Club Twit to all of our uh, Twit Club members. I really appreciate it. Uh, who should we... Uh, what we should got we? Uh, Fernando on the line. Fernando. Fernando on the line. 
Yes. Hi. Oh, look, there he is. He's in the Stargate. Hello. Hello. Hi, Fernando. Hello. Where are you Hello. calling from? San Diego, California. Beautiful. Is it weather gorgeous today? It's it's a little overcast, oh. but it's not bad. We got it's your weather. It's 75 degrees and clear. It was a beautiful yeah. day yesterday for the Butter and Eggs Day in Petaluma. Mm. Mm. Heart healthy. Heart healthy. <laughs> mm. Good for the heart. What can we do yeah. for you, sir? Well, let's start with that. Uh, for those people that don't like the mouth sounds, um, I wanted, I've been listening to you talk about DOT as yes. the uh, um, AI that you're using locally yes. for the LLM. And um, I work for a local hospital and we support their EMR. And um, of course, they don't like their stuff public, right? right. They don't want it local. So I like to set up a local and a library for our support, but it's really difficult. I was trying to do it with Notebook LM, but that's public. And yeah, because it ends up everything ends up going to Google. So right. even if you have local content, Google gets the stuff. And for right. HIP, probably HIPAA prevents you from doing that. I would guess. Well, there, it isn't patient information, but it's just uh, oh, okay. But you're still sensitive to it. You know, folks that call in and are having issues, and we need to fix. Uh, so let me let me tell you what you're looking for, mm -hmm. uh, which is something called RAG. Uh, okay. And this is so. There's two things actually you're looking for. So uh, RAG, which is um, something um, generation, retrieval augmented generation is mm -hmm. an AI term, which means the AI is retrieving local documents to augment its AI, mm -hmm. retrieval augmented generation. The other thing I think you're looking for is a completely local AI, which means you're, so, so this is DOT, by the way. You can see uh, this is one of many open source AI choices that's out there. Uh, I downloaded this one because I'm playing with this, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. The idea is with Dot, you're going to, let me go to the uh, settings here. Uh, if it has any, I don't know where I, <laughs> uh, where do I find the settings? There's going to be a way to choose the model. Um the mo it's you're going to download a model locally now i would suggest so all of these there there are two ways you can operate it needs at some point the base large language model or llm mm -hmm. and that is the thing that teaches it how to talk basically so you're going to either and so chat gpt is an llm so is claude mm -hmm. from anthropic so is google's gemini those are all large language models that are of general have general abilities but in every case, you take a large language model and you tune it for your use case. And the tuning is really what differentiates these LLMs. But you need an LLM. LLMs are costly to generate. They take they're big, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of GPU or NPU power. Um, that's why the big boys have their own models, these LLMs. But there are a handful of models that are available for you to use free to download for free in fact uh, uh facebook meta just released the latest version of their open source model llama l-l-a-m-a -A. get it llama L three, right yeah they just released uh -huh. it and the idea is they're going to work do all the work to generate it they're going to you know use all the electricity <laughs> and to generate this in the big server farms but then you can download the llm and and use it on your machine and then you fine tune it using re retrieval augmented generation with your own documents. Uh, there are other ones. The, the other one that's very good is called Mistral. It's from a French company that has recently received a lot of um, uh, venture capital. But also, Mistral is a downloadable LLM. So the idea of these is instead of going to OpenAI or Gemini or Claude, where you go out on the internet, and, and use their LLM, even with your own documents, which is how uh, this uh, uh, Google uh, LM, Notebook LM works. You give it your documents, but it's still using Gemini, right? It's still going up to the cloud, 
tuning Gemini and getting your answer. You can run these on, on modern machines, especially on Macs, because they have built-in machine language processors, but also the new Windows machines with NPUs. Uh, some Intel, there's one Intel chip that has an NPU. They'll be a little faster, but you can use your GPU for it. So they could take the LLM, apply your documents. I'll show you. So I, the first thing I did was with, uh, with chat GPT. Um, and I created a couple of chat GPT calls them GPTs. Um, one for the language, the programming language I use common lisp and one for Emacs, the editor I use. So what I did, in fact, if I go to the configuration, you'll, you'll see how this uh, works. What I did is I took an LLM, and the LLM is online. So I am going to what is probably the best LLM out there, which is OpenAI's LLM. And then I added to it these documents. Furthermore, I told the LLM, only give me an answer that comes from those documents. So, in fact, I can ask it questions and it will say, you know what? I don't have any of that information in my documents. It also has a checkbox that will allow web browsing. And that you, it, so that is also going to be going out to the public Internet. So this was my first experiment. It works really well, but it is sending data, the questions that I ask, out to the server and coming back with the information. So it, but it's generating brilliant stuff. Now, this is an interesting question. I asked it. Um, I asked it to gen to create a polynomial function using the Lagrange interpolation formula. It said, "This the documents you provided. These methods are not directly detailed in the documents you provided." So it warned me. Look, I'm going to do stuff that is not from the the tuning that you gave me. But it still went out, looked up on the internet the Lagrange polynomial, and even wrote lip, Lisp code for me nice. that I could execute. So it combined the two. It actually did something that I thought was remarkable. Now, I agree with you. I, there's several reasons you don't want to do this. Uh, besides privacy, you also have to pay ChatGPT or Claude for API access. And it's slower because you're sharing their big processor with a lot of other people. So in theory... Here's Dot. With Dot, I have downloaded, I think I downloaded Mistral. Actually, it comes with Mistral 7B, so it's a very nice LLM. And then you upload a folder, so I can upload all the Lisp documents. It churns on it for a while. And upload doesn't mean to the cloud. In this yes, case. that's correct. So upload's probably not the best term. It's actually just adding, using like RNG, ingest. it's adding this these documents to its tuning, its data, its LLM. Okay. Can I ask a question, Leo? Sure. Can that folder be shared? So my my, yes. my bigger vision is everybody loads .ai on their workstation, right? Because I have a team of 10 that... Uh, it could be on I a network call. share, yes. Yeah. In and, fact, and you could tell can... you tell dot where you want to store, where you want it to store its information. Okay. And it will then put it there. And, every, and that could be a network share. Now, my exp I, you know, I've just been playing with this. It seems like, I, first of all, uploading documents takes a while. It's got to chew all of those, right? There, there is, I'm sure, a theoretical limit on what it's doing is it's turning those provided documents into tokens, mm -hmm. which the LLM uses, and there's a limit on the number of tokens an LLM can handle. You perhaps have seen that, uh, you know, with newer LLMs saying, "Oh, now with five hundred thousand tokens." So there are limited, it depends how much you want to upload to it. This is not a solution you probably would want to use yet. It also seems to forget it each time, and I have to reload them each time. You can see it's still chewing on this folder that I provided to it. Uh, there are other ones out there, though. There's one called Jan. Let me launch Jan. Jan uh, also allows you to choose. You can see here I'm choosing which model I want to use. And there are a variety of different models you can choose from using Mistral Instruct. Um, you can use the API for open uh, AI or Claude, but uh, you can also use local ones. Uh, this requires a little more uh, to, uh, effort to do RAG. And that's been my experience with a lot of these. Adding uh, PDFs or documents to the corpus um, is is non-trivial. You have to use Python to do it. So 
This is another one, Jan. This is all local. So the beauty of this is it's a local LLM. I have yet to find the equivalent of what I did with OpenAI and ChatGPT. That's what I'm really looking for, is something right. that I can do just as you want to. Take an LLM, that's the large language model that somebody else has created, download it now, so I'm not sending anything up to the cloud, and then add my own tuning and corpus of data to it, and say to it, hey, you can please use your LLM superpowers, but only give me answers that come from this corpus of material. That's how you right. keep it from giving you, you know. Hallucinations. Yeah, I don't, I'm don't. i trying to find a better word than hallucination because <laughs> it's such a human word. But yeah, it's to keep it from hallucinating. Keep it from making up stuff. Right. Uh, and in my experience, by the way, is that uh, doing what I did with the open AI chat GPT saying just get information from these documents has been a hundred percent reliable. It has not made up anything. Nice. Um, and when, and you saw it warned me when it said, well, look, that's not in your corpus, but I do happen to know how to do a Lagrange polynomial. So uh, here's how you do it. Uh, but it warned me ahead of time. So I think we're really close here. Now you see uh, dot has now absorbed all these documents. I gave it a whole folder and it seems to have absorbed a lot of stuff. Um, how do I've been playing I... with Notebook L LLM, and um, it, the only problem is it only allows you twenty sources. Yes, so and Chat GPT is very... Chat GPT is the same, and I yeah. think that that's that's that tokening mm -hmm. tokenization yeah. thing. Um, I I'm not sure what the limit is on Mistral, which I think this is what is using Mistral, um, but it seems to be. Uh, quite, you can see all these documents I've loaded in there, quite a few. Now, by the way, this is incredibly slow. Yeah. So uh, the benefit of having it local, which I thought would be speed, is not. So the idea of DOT was to make RAG uh, easy. It's still got a ways to go. There you go. Here's a, here, I asked it for some uh, sample code to do a while loop in Lisp. Lisp famously lacks one. Uh, and it was able to come up with some examples and give me some code, but it was slow. So it's it's getting this from the documents I gave it. It wouldn't know this otherwise, I don't think. Sounds good. We're getting close, but I don't think we're there yet. To answer right. your question, I gave you a very long winded answer to your very simple <laughs> question, which is you want RAG, you want as many tokens as possible. There will be a limit on the number of tokens. You will choose an LLM, and there are a variety like Llama and uh, Mistral to choose from. There are many more than that. So you should try different ones. And and yes, in most cases, I think what you're going to have to do is your own Python thing. Uh, you can cobble this all together with Python, including the, the RAG part of it. This The whole idea of DOT is so an idiot like me can just download it and do it. It's worth, it's worth playing with. I, w I, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. Maybe there'll be a new version. It seems like I have to load these this code all the time. I don't know why. Well, that uh, is in beta right now, right? Yeah. So This is just, you know, it's somebody's hobby project. That's yeah. the thing. The idea of Dot was, I don't, you don't even have to choose what model. You don't have to download anything. It just down, it comes with it. And it has Doc Dot, which is what I'm using for documents for RAG, and Big Dot, which is just a, just the LLM by itself. All LLMs are tuned. You're going to tune it further with a corpus of data. Right. Does that? Did I help you at all? Yeah. Yeah. I, just to be patient. I keep yeah, playing it's, with it. So that it's happening. It's, it's yeah. happening. Before the, uh, mm -hmm. by the end of the year, see, this is to me the real promise of AI. Something local that is working on that's your personal information. Mm -hmm. So. Because that could be, you know, that's why I thought this pin was interesting. Record every experience you have and then let the AI generate stuff. And you can ask it stuff like, hey, how did I get to that? How do I get to that gas station that I visited the other day? Yeah. You know, you can ask it, query it about your life. That, to me, that's got to be just around the corner. We're so right. close. But we're not there and, yet. And I think locally, you know, is the biggest key, right? Because... There's so many issues with privacy and our data and everything like that. Yeah. And if you can if you can have it local, I think people would would like it more. Well, this is why Microsoft made a big deal about announcing their AI PCs and why they why Qualcomm is building in these 
uh, they call them neural processing units, uh, into their hardware. Because, yes, people want to do it locally. Yeah. People want her, you know. But I think ultimately, for most stuff, the connected AI is going to be better because it can go out and look on the internet for yeah. information. Uh, it depends on if you're using it for search and new knowledge or if you are looking using it for RAG, right? Right. Yeah. I, well, I ideally both, rag. right? I mean, if I should be able to cobble together something that knows everything every I ever did and can get more information like directions from Google Maps, right? I like it if it can go out and get stuff. I just don't want it to exfiltrate my information. And that's that's a little tricky. Almost yeah. the real problem all of these companies are facing right now is they've run out of material to build these LLMs with. So they're anxious to use your information to help their <laughs> LLMs. They they watch because they really need, they want your email, they want your Reddit posts, they want your tweets, they want everything because the LLMs to train these things is giant maws. They've already absorbed most of the internet. So now they've got to go into your pocket, get some information there. That's really what's going on, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating subject. I this is I'm excited. I think... Uh, AIs can could change the world soon, very soon, in a, in very unexpected and uh, interesting ways. It could also be bad for the world. You know, uh, there will be consequences. It is disruptive. Hey, I'm glad you asked. Got get, gave, got me a chance to get up on my soapbox. I'll get down now. <laughs> Thanks, Leo and Mike. I really appreciate your help. Great yeah, to talk great to question. you. Thank you. You're watching Ask the Tech Guys, Micah Sargent. And Leo Laporte, more of your calls coming up, 888-724-2884. Don't get me started on AI. Don't get me started. I saw that, right? I lost control. It's okay, though. I, I'm so, I'm, I'm see, excited, too. And I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we should just forget ethics, morals, copyright. Give it everything. Okay. Give it everything. I don't think the ethics and the morals part... I agree with. Give it everything. The copyright part, I do agree. Give with. it everything, because the more it knows, the better the chance it's going to solve cure cancer, and f invent fusion, and put us on the moon, and all the stuff that, you know, all that stuff it could do. I'd love if it had access to the patented medication. Yes. Created. Yeah. AI is is only as good as the stuff that is put into it. Yeah. And and as as uh, Sam Altman at OpenAI said, you don't want to. AI that's only trained in the public domain because it won't know much. Nor do you want an AI that's trained on what we are doing right now, creating with AI. Like pretty yeah, soon there's going to be a lot of AI stuff that AI is going to get trained that's on. That's how you get bovine encephalitis. That is, I, I read that. <laughs> I'll explain why I said that someday, but it's too disgusting to do it now. I'll, I'll explain it. So BCE was a was a big problem in in the UK because cows were eating meal made out of cows. Oh, and so it was spreading. Got it. So you don't want AI to get uh, yeah, that's right? a, yeah, BCE that's fair <laughs> by eating itself. Well, it's always bad. Uh, that was a good reference. It's always bad to do that. Always. Yeah, don't eat. You need original material. Mm-hmm. Did you listen to Taylor Swift's new album? No. I Is think it? there are two. Oh, you know who will have listened to the new album? Who? Abrar, Abrar Alhiti. Alhiti. Yeah. She'll be in soon. Who should we uh, talk to next? Yeah. Somebody yeah, waiting on the Tim. line. Tim? Hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. What, well, we know your name. Where are you calling from? Ooh, Tim's in the dark. We're coming to you from the 3 com network, Netcam. Oh, my God. <laughs> Blast from the past. You have to hold a phone to your ear because we never could get audio working. <laughs> Hey, that's great. You yeah. seem too young to have ever seen the screensavers. Oh, no. It was back in, uh, I want to say, 1998. I that's was right. a junior in high school. Yeah. <gasps> Did you I call in? Watching. Did you call in? I never. This is my first time. Oh, welcome. Well, welcome. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Louisville, Kentucky. Love Louisville. We went out. I don't know if you yep. remember, but Kate and I went to Louisville, one of our very first appearances. We went to the little cable company's offices there and, and signed on. Oh, autographs. yeah? It was an awesome experience. Awesome. Yeah. Way yeah. back when. That's so, probably 2000 or 1999, thereabouts. Uh-huh. What can and we do for you? The last time I ran into you, Leo, was uh, the 2011 Macworld. 
you remember the sleeve 360 iPad case? <laughs> the one that you tethered? That was me. That, that was, was that you. Was my iPad case. I yeah. love it. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Did you uh, make it? Uh, yeah, we uh, manufactured it. Does it, or, are like, you still doing it? We came up with the product. No, we ended up selling it uh, about a year and a half later. We just offloaded the IP, basically. But I hope you, you made a little money. Everywhere. I hope you made a little money on it. Yeah, I think we did okay. Good. <laughs> Congratulations. Good. Uh -huh. good. See, isn't yeah. that great? Uh huh. This is so, the wearable. Uh, it was a wearable iPad case. Correct. Yeah, you could tether it to your hand, rotate it three hundred and sixty degrees. And now it's almost like ubiquitous. I see that on so many different cases. You, you had know, a it's just like so. Did you just have this idea and say, uh, "Let's make it"? It was the my buddy came home with the iPad when it first came out, and we had the idea, like the concept, within like thirty minutes. Nice of like after I had showed up there. So nice. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. that's I am so thrilled to see you again. And yeah. I'm so glad to hear that it ended well for you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Here is the three sleeve 360. Oh, my gosh. Talk about another class <laughs> from the past. Oh, my goodness. Don't go to wow. sleeve360.com. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's there. Nobody's home anymore. Uh, Here, see? Oh, she's kinda, yeah, that was But this was, was brilliant. I mean, really, seriously. Yeah, you see them everywhere now. Uh-huh. But yep. uh, you were the first to think of it. My dentist yeah. has three of them. Does he? No. no. <laughs> Is that Steve right there? Yeah. No, that's some guy at a, at a That restaurant. was Carter. That's the other guy. That's there. Carter. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. You saw him too oh, at the show. That's so great. I still think that 2011 Macworld was like one of the last great Macworlds. It really was. And you one know? of the things that happened at Macworld is it became an accessory show, accessories for mostly iPhones, unfortunately. But it, but, yeah. but it really became an accessory show. So that was a good place for you to be. I want that mm -hmm. thing right now. I know. What can we do for yeah. you today? Nice to talk to so you. So my again. question uh, today, it has to deal with payment methods when it comes to subscriptions on the iPhone. Okay. So I feel like I've, I'm locked in with the single payment method. To pay for subscriptions through my phone. And, you should you know, move to the free. EU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, you know, I'm an architectural photographer and then oh, I also own a preschool. Oh. And so there are certain subscriptions that I want to pay for, but I have to use the same card when I do that and it drives my accountant nuts. Oh, and so. Well, you can have multiple is, cards on here. But can you use but for app for the multiple cards oh, for, for the, the app actual store. subscriptions? Yeah, for so the app store. This that ooh. you can't, can you? That's you, an interesting question. You can, but it is it's something that you have to be very proactive about because essentially what you would have to do um, in the settings for the for your Apple ID. There's a section that's marked payments, and you've probably seen this screen many times. And in that screen, there you can have multiple payment options, and it actually lets you uh, reorder those payment options. So, for example, I've got three cards in there, and or one of I think it's two cards in a PayPal account, and whichever one is at the top, that is the one that Apple will start with when it tries to charge you. And then if there's nothing in that account or if there's something wrong, then it goes down, down, down. So what you would have to do, and this is why I say it, I don't think that it's a tenable solution, is that you would have to keep in mind when that subscription payment is coming up and then you'd need to move that card to the top of the list right before that happened. Wow. That's not a great solution. No. I think that you might want to look into a managed Apple ID situation. Ah. Um, if you do a managed Apple ID, then you can have one that's personal or one that's for this job and then one that's for the other. And it gets a little bit easier to switch between them, particularly if it's on an iPad. Um, and I think that that might help with the payment switching. I, I don't quote me on that a hundred percent, but I think that that would be something to look into because, uh, being able to do that is, is, is a possibility. But and yeah. that seems like something like a corporate, a would corporation would want with, yeah. so that you could have your personal account, but you could have your corporate card mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. 
So I can go into payment and shipping and I have one card in there, but I can add another payment method. Mm -hmm. And so you would add that second one. And then once you do, Leo, you'll see a little, uh, the little three lines that pop up to the right whenever it's a list that can be reordered. Okay. And then you, whichever one is at the top, that's the one that Apple goes to first. So, so you have to remember. So that would be the way to do that is if you, I mean, when you were going to charge something that you wanted, your accountant wanted to be on your corporate card, you'd switch. You just have to remember to switch back afterwards. Yeah. So every time, right? That's not fun, right? You'd have to go in and manually do it, but that is a solution. That is yeah. I, so I just added my Apple card to payments, but that's going to default to that. Yeah. If that's at the top now, yes. It's at the top. So there should be edit in the top right, I believe. So, okay. And then you can, uh, you can reorder you can switch whichever around. one goes at the top. Yeah. Under edit, oh yeah, I can swap those around. Yeah, so, and then whichever okay. one goes to the top there on the, yep, now. So now the American Express will is. Will go first. And or then, I can make the Apple card. Exactly. I'd have to do that each time? You'd have to do that each time. <sighs> yeah, so it's not a great <sighs> solution. You can use multiple yeah, payment methods. Yeah, I think methods. that, that would which, work, though. Yeah. Yeah, you can I set a calendar. Because a lot of times when I do these uh, subscriptions, it's on an annual basis. Right, oh, you have to do so, that's true. Once a year, go in and, yeah. and swap it around. Yeah. Okay, that actually seems much more doable than every single month having to do that. But but, um, but when you're in the app store, you can't. There's no drop down there to choose. You have to. You have to yeah, go back go, into payments. Go into to, that first. To, yep. And by the way, you have to log in each time too because they want to protect you. Yeah, usually you can face ID though. Um, if you've logged in with face ID into the app store recently, then that'll be there. Um, another option would be. Someone's kind of, I think oh, I maybe bought something bringing it up buy. is link it to your <laughs> PayPal. And then on the PayPal side, you could switch between the two cards. Um, but I, I think that this is a little bit easier, especially like you said, if you're only doing it annually, this seems uh, not, not too difficult, but we will include a link in the show notes. Um, what is it? Techguylabs.com uh, to the managed Apple IDs. You just gave me though a thread that I'm going to pull on. Okay. Tug on it. Because there might be some things like PayPal where you could have multiple cards mm -hmm. and it would all go to, so Apple go to PayPal and then whatever is active in PayPal would be easier, right? Because you could swap that around. Yeah, but is it easier to swap that around? And, it, and can you do it? I wonder if there are payment solutions where you can have 10 Ooh, cards in there. And have it automatically. And have it automatically choose. And then Apple doesn't have to know. Apple's right. just going to say, okay, say, okay, I'm okay, charge that PayPal. thing. Yeah, like, you know, how they have, you know, the privacy app, how you can create yeah. things like. Yeah, you know. I use privacy. I don't think privacy will let you have a default card, though. It's no. But maybe, yeah, that's a really, maybe PayPal, I don't know, that's a really, see, that might be another way to handle it is a third party that looks to Apple like the same party. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's even exists, but that's an interesting. Sounds like a great new business yeah, for you. That's a good point. We could call it. Card 360. Yeah, <laughs> that's a ticket. It's how it starts. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the if it's an annual subscription, just hopping in and changing that right before it happens. And maybe your accountant yeah. will thank you for that extra bit of work. <laughs> so great to see all you right, again well, after all this time. Yeah, good to see you. On the, yeah. on the Twit Netcam Network. <laughs> that's right. I had a fight with Tech TV because they wanted to call it uh, a webcam. And which was the common term then. And I said, but it's not on the web. It's a net cam. And I don't know how I convinced him to call it a net cam, which I think has a little <laughs> better sound to it. Don't you think the net cam yeah. network? Yeah. yeah. It's got yeah, it definitely had a ring to it. Yeah. You know? See, I wanted to also call this net casts, but nobody bought that one. <laughs> yeah. You I lost tried. that one, but. Because it's not. It still uh, lived on for several years though. I, I mean, well, <laughs> solely with me. <laughs> Uh, finally, my marketing guy, Jerry, said, you can't keep calling it a netcast. No one knows what the hell you're talking about. But a net, it's such yeah. a better name than a podcast. And now, today, people go, "What? what's a pod? Right? They don't remember iPods. Well, no, but also people call them pods. I don't they know think they call it them stands nets. for play on demand. Who said that? Everybody. That's wild. Those are the same people who think Jeep stands for just every essential part. Or Fiat. Fix it again, Tony. Yeah, Tony, <laughs> whoever you are. Thank you for your Thanks call. for the Great call. Great to catch yeah. up with you. Thank you. <laughs>
Have a great day. Uh, oh. All right, you too. Bye-bye. I believe that's the sound of this episode powering down, yes? Is it? Oh, come on. It's only one... 14. Well, I know we've got an audience. I know we have. We already, the studio is, audience is starting to filter in. Uh, but I would really like to do. Quick email? Okay. We haven't done any email today. That's a good idea. I'll put up a, a shot clock. Did we, we mailed the, uh, we mailed the uh, uh, Newton message pad out to that guy, right? Last week. I John we Ashley would maybe know. Yeah, John more. Ashley mailed it out, I think. Uh, Google takeout photos, says Steve. Yes. I've been using Google Photos for several years now, but I am up to my 15 gigabyte limit. Yeah. Oh, that'll happen. Oh, man, I got two terabytes. I'm I'm hitting the ceiling with two terabytes. <laughs> uh, and I want to move photos to a hard drive to free up space and continue using Google Photos storage. When I, let, when I looked into Google Takeout, it lets me remove photos. Yeah, it does to a hard drive. Yeah, but it separates the metadata from the pictures into a JSON file. This causes problems when rematching the data to picture later on. Also, the delete command is very limited the number of photos I can delete per click. There is a way around this. There are a couple of ways around this. I did this by hand many moons ago, and I used a variety of tools. I've talked about this before to mm -hmm. do this. But honestly, and it is a sponsor, so I'll have to disclaim this. I was really pleased when I found out Mylio can import Google Photo Takeout directly from those zip files. Yeah, specifically works with those. And so it's very frustrating because Google does have takeout. That's great, mm -hmm. right? That was from day one. Google said, we don't want to ever be make you trapped. But the way they made it so that you really never wanted to use it is they zip them up into file. You can say how big the file is. I think they've gone past the two gig limit, but they zip it up. They separate the EXIF into a JSON file They and they change the file names and all this stuff. So Mylio is smart about the format. And so you you still download all the zip files, but then you can import them into Mylio. Now, the good news is Mylio is free for one computer. So if you're using Mylio, you'll see here, there's all these different places, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Android phones. Let's see, where's the Google takeout? Maybe because I already did it. Photos, or maybe they don't do it anymore. I don't know. Let's see. Maybe it's just to use an existing folder. You download all your stuff and you import it. And Miley also will delete duplicates, which I found very handy because uh, I have, of course, everything's in my Google Photos. I didn't want everything. I wanted the things that were in Google Photos only, right? Mm -hmm. So I it deleted the stuff that was doubled. That was, was very smart. Uh, so I only got the new stuff. Nice. Where is that? I wonder if that's photos from Instagram, Flickr. I don't know. It seemed like they said in the past it said Google Takeout. Let me let me do a let's do a. There you go. Thank you. There's the Mylio help file. Import from a Google. That's Google Photos. But does it use Takeout? I think it does. Yeah. yeah use Takeout. Download uses Takeout. It. Yeah. So it will understand that. That's how I did it, and I got I don't know a hundred thousand photos in there. So your 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 piddly fifteen gigabytes will be fine. <laughs> Bless oh, you. Excuse me. Shouldn't take too long. Though I'll, I will show you the comp, more complicated way, and I, I think I've talked about this yeah. uh, before. I used a pair of programs to uh, get stuff out of my Google Photos. <laughs> Excuse me. I think this hat's making me sneeze. Is that possible? <laughs> leather? I thought you... Is that, is that possible? You've become allergic to leather? Clean up Google Photos. Take a, I put this into... Um, a Notion page, because I, I knew I wouldn't remember it. So I wrote a little script to unzip. I removed the JSON files, because what I did is I, I used JHead, which is a, a free tool, I think it's Python, to take the EXIF files, move it into folders by year, month, day, re renaming the file with the date and time. And then I use this really nice tool from Phil Harvey called the EXIF tool. These are both free, JHead and EXIF tool. The EXIF tool is written in Perl, but he keeps it up to date. You see the latest version is from April 20, April 18th, 2024, which is pretty recent, like two days ago. So this is a really powerful library. It's a command line application that processes all of these and cleans them up. So between JHead and EXIF tool, I was able to get those into better shape.
That's when I was doing it by hand. I have to tell you, once I found Miley. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay. Yeah, this that's, is a, that's an archived much page. Much easier. Yeah. But those are, two good, those are two good tools to know about, JHead and Exif tool. We'll put links in the show notes to both of those. They're handy. They work on Mac, Windows, Linux, because, uh, you know, they're Perl. Perl and Python, I believe. Uh, good question. Uh, one more. What do you say? Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Moving DNS off of Google from Tim. Hi, guys. I've been using Google DNS for several years as a personal for personal domain. I have a couple of Linux servers, a PFSense FW that I use a dynamic DNS client to update the relevant A records, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm now looking for another provider that would support dynamic DNS updates. I was wondering if you have recommendations. Huh. Wait. So he's running a server. So this is the issue uh, when you're running a server at home. What did we say last week? Don't. Don't. Don't but, run a server at home. But if you're going to do it, even though we say don't. <laughs> because your uh, internet service provider with a home network does not guarantee you an static IP address, it changes. So you need to use something called Dyn DNS that periodically, it, usually it's running as a client on your server, checks to see what the IP address is and adds a forwarding so that you can point people at a static IP address and then Dyn DNS will connect it to the actual IP address and your server will continue to work. You know what I use? What do you use? Eero. Eero has Does now, it do that? Does, has a feature dynamic DNS built in. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. A good router, many routers actually do support Dyn DNS. So that's one thing to look at. Um, honestly, I'm not sure what else is out there. Um, yeah, I because the last time I looked into this, doing it... PFSense does it automatically, somebody's saying. YZF donor. Hello, YZF. I was using uh, a free thing for a while, and I did not end up liking it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cloudflare, of course, is an option. Uh, it has dynamic DNS. But yeah, I, feel, I've, I think... Cloudflare would be a very good choice, actually. Yeah. Cloudflare would probably be my first choice. Uh, because they're very reliable. So that would be one to look at. And you can get, it looks like and it's free, free usually. Yeah, yeah, free with any uh, Cloudflare. In fact, these days don't use Dyn DNS, which is, which is a company that's done it for years. Either do it in your router, which is cool, or do it with Cloudflare. I think that's a great way to do it. Because Cloudflare will also give you other uh, benefits. All right. I could do one more. Or do you want to do a call? I don't think we have a call, so yeah, let's do one more. Okay. You don't want to? You don't want to? No? Okay. no. I think it's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap? I don't care. Uh, mirroring hard drives issue, says Shelly. Hi, Leo and Micah. Howdy. Shelly's in Kansas. Oh. I have followed you neighbor. since Tech TV days, Leo. Twit Network is wonderful with all the helpful info. Love what you and Mike could do. Thank you. I have an issue. It's driving me crazy because it doesn't seem to make any sense. I have two identical, identical, ladies and gentlemen, Samsung external hard drives. They're both four terabytes. Okay. Take a note. I previously always manually saved to them so they were a little different because I'd be cleaning up files, renaming folders on one drive, get rid of some duplicate items. They're a little bit different. I formatted the one I want to make match. I did the backup once by manually copying and pasting. For, ooh, it's off by a significant amount, 256 gigabytes, essentially. So I formatted it again, used free file sync, mirrored the drive. Still, 205 gigabytes difference. <laughs> Random checks looks like everything's there, but I don't see how it could be. It could be. Can you tell me what I need to be looking for? Why is the... F so what she's basically doing is she thinks making a duplicate of the drive. Uh -huh. but, but the difference in f drive consumption worries her. And there's a lot of reasons that could be. I wouldn't worry about that if it looks the same. Now, those aren't the tools I would use. So if you really want to make this uh, as duplicate as possible, Samsung offers, every hard drive manufacturer offers a bit copy, sector copy tool. And that's, that's going to give you identical, like the 
free size will be matching everything because it does it it says this it doesn't know anything about files this is the problem you're doing a file copy mm -hmm. And there's slack on files. There's all sorts of reasons why a file might occupy more space or less space on one drive than another. Don't worry about that. We probably have all the files. But if you really want them to match, Samsung offers probably on their website for download a sector copying utility designed to duplicate a drive when you're moving from one drive to the other. That will go sector by sector, doesn't care about files, and just make sure all the sectors match. Then the file sizes will be the usage will be identical. I wouldn't worry about the identical usage. My tool that I would use for something like this is called rsync. It's available uh, on on all Unix style machines, Mac and Linux. I think there's even rsync. Well, you can use RoboCopy on Windows, but I prefer rsync. rsync is a very smart copying tool that will only copy file changes. In fact, you could have done it with rsync without de deleting the uh, contents of the original drive, it would have been much faster because rsync would look at each file and say, that's different, that's the same, that's different, that's the same, and only copy the changes. Uh, in any event, uh, rsync is your friend for future. It's a command line. You'll have to learn how to use it. It's not hard. Uh, but I would say find the Samsung sector by sector copying tool, and that will do it. Yeah, you taught you told me about rsync, and I use that all the time. rsync is, oh, you use it. Good mm -hmm. for you amazing tool comes on all Macs and Linux machines. I don't know. I'm sure there's an rsync for windows. The idea of rsync is it's um, only copy the changes. So it's very efficient and it does verification. So it's very effective. That's what I like. Copying is not very good. It's there's lots of errors get introduced, things like that. You want to check after copy to make sure it, it worked. Um, but th it doesn't, it, it's not surprising that the different, there's a difference. Uh, it just, it's the way drives are. <laughs> Sometimes files can occupy more space, uh, not logically, but physically. Uh, and and that's all it is. It's, it's probably harmless. All right. Mostly harmless. I think we should probably end now. I don't want to end. I like this show. I like keep, I want to keep doing it. But there's another show that's also great that's oh, coming up. And you and I are going to be on it. It's called This Week in Tech, our 19th anniversary show. We're going to have a live studio audience. Abrar Alhidi's on her way up. She's going to join us, as will Jason Howell, his first time returned to the network since we summarily fired his ass, which was a mean thing to do. No, we had to lay him off because <laughs> we ran out of money. And we don't want to run out of money anymore. And we love Jason still. I'm going to, we're going to tell you about his new thing that he's doing called Dexploder. We're going to support him. John, you're looking at me like I said a bad thing. No. I mean, you I did. just feel I feel terrible because we had to lay off people uh, and uh, nobody ever wants to do that. And we don't want to ever do it again. So please join Club Twit and keep this boy from crying. Uh, I did cry. I shed tears. It was very hard. It's very hard with Aunt and Jason and uh, Victor. It was it was a sad day. We don't want to do that anymore. We like to keep doing what we're doing. So please twit.tv slash club twit. Micah Sargent, you're going to be back on Tuesday with iOS Today, on Thursday with Tech News Weekly, and next Sunday with Ask the Tech Guys. Once again. Did I miss anything? You did not. I will be here, for, you know, whenever I feel like showing up. <laughs> uh, uh, what else? Oh, Stacy's Book Club's coming up yeah, Thursday. Make That's sure going to tune be in fun. For that. Yeah. If you haven't read We Are Legion, the first book in the Bobaverse series, and you're in the mood, Dennis E. Taylor, highly recommend it. It's a great Audible listen, to if you have an Audible account. Twit.tv slash ATG or Tech Guy Labs for the show notes. TechGuyLabs.com for the show notes. You can uh, email us, ATG at Twit.tv. Yep. You can also call us during the week, 888-724-2884. Leave to a leave voice voicemail. Mail. Yeah, that's a nice way to do it. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, that would be Micah Sargent. And that there is Leo Lepore. We'll see you next time. Have a great Geek Week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.